I have an experience that I'd like to share with you. In 2004, I was living in a town called Newcastle, Pennsylvania. It's roughly an hour from Pittsburgh, give or take, depending on traffic. I had just moved there with my then husband, and we were renting the top floor of this house that was owned by an older couple who had lived on the first floor. They were very pleasant, nice people, but they did not have any children or grandchildren, so they weren't really interested in having people around. I mean, it suited us just fine because my husband and I both worked long hours at our jobs. We did have one neighbor, though. His name was Bill, and he lived across the street and was in a very similar situation, rented out to somebody else who lived downstairs while he occupied the upstairs apartment himself. This is where it gets really creepy, and I get goosebumps just recalling this story. Okay, so one night, I'm lying in bed, and I could hear Bill's door open. Now, this is at least a small part of town, so it wasn't uncommon to see people walking around at all hours of the night, but what was strange about this particular instance was that his door opened and then closed again almost immediately after. So, I thought nothing of it until maybe an hour later when he knocked on our front door. My husband answered the door and let him in because we knew him well enough to know that something must have been wrong for him to be knocking on our door at two in the morning, or whatever time it was by then. He came into our living room where my husband had sat down with him and just started crying uncontrollably. I'm not talking about just sobbing, like sobbing really hard, like somebody had died or something equally as serious. We were both very confused, and as you can imagine, it was pretty awkward. Why was he acting this way? He eventually calmed down and told us. Here's where things get even more bizarre. He informed us that while sitting in his apartment earlier that evening, there was a knock at his front door. It made no sense because we were the only ones who lived upstairs from him, so there could have been nobody else up there than himself. And there's an actual metal gate that is right at the entrance of the stairs that leads up to his door. So if you're on the outside, you have to have a key or a way to get in. You can't just make your way up to his front door without getting in. So that was already ringing bells. Anyway, he said that when he opened the door, there was a little girl standing on his doorstep. And she asked him if her mommy lived here. He told us that it took him by surprise because this child looked no older than five or six, but at the same time, she had an air of maturity about her, and there was something else really wrong. Her hair was covering her face, and he couldn't really see her face that well. Like you could tell that when you were looking at her, she wasn't just your average kid. She also seemed to be very well dressed for being out here at night, and it seemed completely out of place and strange. So, instead of answering yes or no to whether or not mommy lived up here, he simply closed his front door and went back into his apartment without saying anything else to the young girl who stood outside waiting for someone or anyone to answer her question. He said then that he heard the girl walk away, go downstairs, but when he looked out his window, she was nowhere in sight, like she had just vanished into thin air or something. Now, you might be hearing this and thinking, okay, how was this at all creepy? Well, Bill went on to tell us, when we asked and prodded, that right before he responded to her, or didn't respond, she moved the hair out of her face, and he saw her eyes for the first time. I think you know where this is going. Her eyes were pitch black. And as soon as he looked into her eyes, he claimed that he felt an overwhelming sense of dread like he's never felt before. Needless to say, we were both very freaked out by his story. So my husband went to go check on his apartment and all around for any signs of where this little girl might have gone, if not for staying around the area. But there was nothing, no evidence whatsoever. And as strange as that was, 
That was the last and only time that's ever happened, at least that I was aware of. It took us a little while before we can get him back into his apartment. It was such an odd tale from our neighbor, especially because he was such a level-headed guy. So this didn't feel like a prank. It felt weird. Anyway, that's my experience. And don't get me wrong, I know Pennsylvania is full of strange, unexplainable things, but that one definitely takes the cake for me. A few months ago, I went camping with my family. We had been looking forward to this camping trip for a while, but our parents' busy schedule had made us cancel our plans time and time again. My siblings and I had given up until Dad told us we would be having a camping trip over the weekend. My siblings and I were thrilled, to say the least, as they had been looking forward to the camping trip for a long time. Mom and Dad had planned the campsite and they had marked a spot that would be perfect. We all looked forward to the weekend and we all shouted in ecstasy as the week had ended. Late Friday afternoon, we were on our way to the campsite. I was more composed compared to my siblings. They were so hyper. Mom had to threaten them before they could stop their noises. After a 30 minute drive, we got to the campsite. It was a location close to the woods. The scenery was great and the atmosphere was perfect. While I admired the scenery, I had a slight discomforting feeling about the woods. It was like I could feel a presence. The presence was ghostly and gave me chills. I shook my head lightly and pushed the thoughts out of my mind, blaming it on paranoia. We got our camping gear out and the car and arranged them. I helped my father set up the tents while my siblings helped mother bring out the things from the car. A little while later, everything was set up and our camping was underway. It was dark by the time we were done, and so we huddled together by a fire as it was a bit chilly. Mom served us some snacks that she had brought along and everyone munched away. My siblings requested to hear some scary stories, as if on reflex, my mind went back to the presence I had felt earlier in the day. And once again, a chill ran through me, making me shiver. I wanted to stop my father and tell him it was a bad idea. But ultimately, I chose not to say anything. Dad and Mom told their share of ghost stories, spooking my siblings so much. It took a bit of effort to get them into bed. A few minutes later, I moved a bit deeper into the woods to take a leak as I had drunk too much water. I grabbed a light, heading off into the wilderness to relieve myself. After walking what I would have considered a considerable distance, I squatted down when I felt this sensation of being watched. This time around, the chill I felt was bone deep. It felt like somebody had poured a bucket of ice cold water on my body. I turned around to take a look, but to my surprise, I found no one. I turned to face front. Then I saw it, standing right in front of me. I was rooted to the spot. I didn't know if this was caused by fear or shock. I had no idea. I didn't know what to call it. It was not human. That much was certain. I let out a scream and the last thing I remember was seeing bright lights before I passed out. When I awoke, I found myself in a bright room, strapped to a chair. I was surrounded by machines and devices of all sorts. It was at this point that it hit me. I had been abducted by aliens. While I was struggling to get out of my constraints, one of them came in. It looked at me curiously and touched my face. Its hands were cold and they gave me the chills. They reminded me of the chill I had felt earlier in the forest. Was that as a result of them touching me? 
It then moved towards one of the computers, inputted something. It beeped and displayed a language that was unknown to me, and while I was trying to understand what they meant, an electric shock ran through me, making me convulse violently on the chair. After a while, the shocks had stopped, but my body felt numb, and I had a sensation that I had been pricked by thousands of needles. Turning back to look at me, I saw a pensive look on its face as it faced the computer again while inputting something else. I had a look of terror on my face as I felt an intense pain course through my body. The pain was so great it threatened to tear my mind apart. A few minutes felt like an eternity while enduring this hellish pain. I was put through several other tests before it shook its head and stepped out of the room. A few minutes later, it came in with others of its kind. I was surprised to see that they all looked the same. They all looked at me, and I could faintly hear them muttering something like, Another failure. Return her to where you picked her from. I was glad to wake up at our campsite where I had the protection of my parents. To my surprise, our camping trip was concluded. It was Sunday afternoon. I had been gone for almost two days. With trepidation, I recounted my ordeal to my parents, but to my surprise, they laughed at me and told me I did not go anywhere. I was present all through the camping exercise. They both noticed that I was a bit absent-minded, and I guess I behaved mechanically like a robot that has been programmed to do a particular set of tasks. Except for my absent-mindedness, I was present all through, so my tale of aliens and being abducted was discounted as a lie by my parents. They found it hard to believe. They did not believe in the existence of that or extraterrestrial life. Despite all they said, I knew everything I felt was real. In 1996, I worked for a few years in the Parks and Recreation Services in Idaho State. I was a ranger for a time as well, and also spent some of my time keeping people out of the illegal areas of the wilderness, including national forests, lakes, rivers, and streams, as well as state game lands. I would say that at least once a month, we had to investigate reports of Bigfoot sightings from people around the area. The most common report of Bigfoot sightings is that somebody would have heard something walking through their yard at night or their campsite. They would also look outside but could never see anything because it was dark. These people often reported hearing heavy footsteps only feet away from their camper. Very strange. People would also report a strange, eerie feeling in your gut, telling you something isn't right. One particular case sticks out of my mind because it was so strange. In 98, I got called into work one night after midnight on a Sunday morning to meet with two rangers who were already working at Bear Lake State Park, along with several deputies from the county sheriff's department to investigate a supposed sighting. Bear Lake is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the western United States, and don't quote me on this, but... I believe it is the second largest lake right next to the Utah Lake. All of us rangers had been called to an area that we all refer to it as the Point. There was a large campground with about 20 campsites that were occupied by people, just vacationing for several weeks or hanging out during their summer break. Several people that we had talked to reported seeing something walking around outside their tent that was much larger than any man, and they were scared. They said it kept pacing up and down through each campsite, making loud noises and whooping sounds, but nobody ever saw anything because it was so dark outside. They just heard heavy, raspy breathing from someone they claimed smoked 20 packs a day. They also, at least a few of them, reported a very foul smell, like raw sewage and urine. The deputies reported that they had never smelt anything like this before, and some of the rangers claimed it was the worst smell they had ever encountered. 
The deputies did not know what to make of all these reports, so they called for backup from the State Parks Department to investigate further. The deputy who first responded stated that he began investigating and saw something large moving towards the campground. When he yelled at it and tried to shine a flashlight on it, he didn't find anything, but he kept hearing noises the entire night that left him chilled. He also noticed a foul odor coming from within several tents, which made him feel uneasy. He would quickly return back towards his patrol car, parked down by the lake shore. Another deputy arrived. Both men decided to search around the campground after dark with flashlights, looking for anything unusual, such as footprints or any signs of an intruder being present, since nothing else seemed unusual, except those reports about hearing strange noises at night while trying to sleep. One particular report stood out among others. There was one camper who refused multiple requests by law enforcement officers throughout the night to check his tent so they could see if he was okay. The camper refused to come out of his tent, and even when deputies asked him several times, he kept saying no. He was scared. He was thinking that that thing was out there and was going to grab him. After several hours of convincing, around 4.30 in the morning, he decided to come out, and you could tell he was completely petrified. Apparently, this area had been a hotbed for sightings and strange things. We then spent several hours walking around Bear Lake, looking for any signs, but found nothing. Just lots of tracks left behind by deer with other strange animals. We did find some prints leading down towards the point where people were camping, but these looked similar enough that they could have been made by humans wearing boots, not necessarily large Bigfoot tracks. And that's about the extent of my sightings. I know it's nothing crazy, but those are the things we experienced. And this went on for a few more years, but fortunately, I never had to see anything. In 1999, I was living in a small house with my parents, sister, and brother. My family had just moved to this new place from another state, so we didn't have much furniture or anything else for that matter. I slept on the couch because there weren't enough beds for everyone. Yet, our dog slept next to me at night, as she always did when we all went to bed. One particular night, after being asleep for hours already, I woke up around three in the morning and saw what appeared to be an older man standing by the door, staring directly at me. My eyes were still adjusting though, but he wore black clothing, which stood out against the white walls of my parents' room where his body was mostly positioned towards. His face was gaunt looking, but not scary if that makes sense. He seemed very pale, but wasn't exactly creepy looking, although he did appear quite thin and skeletal-like in appearance. I froze in fear while staring back at him through squinting eyes. It hurt trying to look more clearly due to how bright everything seemed, even though there was only one light bulb that hung above us near the ceiling inside our home. He suddenly vanished without making any sounds whatsoever. After realizing this happened, I told myself never again will I let myself fall asleep unless someone stays awake watching over me. Now a few nights go by, and something far worse occurs. I wake up again around 3 in the morning. This time, my dog was no longer lying next to me on the couch where I slept. She usually never left my side at night, so something must have happened with her that caused her to leave. This freaked me out badly since she loved sleeping right by my arm and hand area every single night. After realizing this, I looked over towards the door and saw what appeared to be a very tall being turning around. It stopped, turned back to face me, and all I could see was a skeletal face and bright orange eyes with no pupils. The worst part 
was that he had large fangs protruding out of his mouth. I immediately sat up on the couch and screamed while also yelling for my parents who slept in their bedroom right across from where this thing stood. I can remember very vividly. His face was very angular looking, cheekbones very high and standing out. He also had long dark hair covering most of the top half of his head while he wore a black trench coat like robe which went down past his feet. I don't really remember what happened after that, but I do recall waking up the next day and everything felt normal. Now, a few months later, we moved out of that house due to many strange things happening there, including hearing voices coming from what sounded like inside our walls and ceiling, seeing shadowy figures move around in front of us when going into different rooms. We never did figure out who or what it was exactly, but we had speculation. My parents knew of somebody, well, an enemy who lived nearby. They had apparently been doing all sorts of voodoo and black magic for some reason. I was never told the full story because both my parents have passed, but apparently my parents and this man must have rubbed each other the wrong way. And little did they know, he practiced hexes and curses, because it sounds like that's what he was doing. I'm not saying this as a matter of fact. It's just a theory. But my parents suspected that he had been the one who was conjuring demons and spirits to come and attack us. That's why we moved out. It was by far the scariest experience of my life. I'll always remember my father's theory on all of this. He thinks that this old man was not just a magic practitioner, but a shapeshifter of some kind. He can recall sitting out on the front porch with his tobacco pipe and seeing this unusually large coyote come by almost every night with what he described as disturbingly human-like eyes. Now, make that what you will, but when you put two and two together, you kind of can't help but come up with the same conclusion that me and my family did. I'm 37 years old now, so this story goes back to the 80s and 90s while growing up, and all the horrific things I saw and experiences while on the reservation. My grandmother, mother, and cousins were deeply into witchcraft. I would hear stories of skinwalkers and dogmen lurking around the area, but little did I know what was about to come my way. Now, keep in mind, we also didn't use the term skinwalkers and dogmen. I'm just simplifying that for you so you can understand. It started with a pretty normally quiet night. Mostly everybody had gone to bed early due to a long day at work or just the general monotony of everyday life. I remember that night like it was yesterday. I had just started heading back towards my room when I heard a noise coming from the front porch outside. At first, I thought it was possibly an animal scampering about or one of our neighbor's dogs out for some late night fun. But I noticed something, something different near the bushes outside the front of our home with fur that appeared to be almost pitch black in color. My heart began pounding in my chest as I crept closer and closer to try and get a better view of what this thing was. I could make out a face that seemed almost canine-like, sharp teeth, disgustingly yellow eyes. For a brief moment, it looked right at me, and I felt my knees wobble as I stumbled back in shock. My mother heard the commotion outside and came in to investigate, along with my uncle, who had a few felonies on his record, but always seemed to know more about the dark side of life than anyone else. We both stood there in utter disgust at what we were seeing before our very eyes. What appeared to be some kind of hybrid animal, a creature made up of parts from 
various species of wildlife. Or so I thought. I remember my uncle muttering something under his breath about skinwalkers and shape-shifting witches while my mother was in complete shock and disbelief. I had heard stories before about shapeshifters, but this was different, because usually, at least from what I grew up around, they would shapeshift into benign animals. But again, keep in mind, I had never been in a situation where I had seen this practice go on in a malevolent way. My uncle then instructed us to go back inside the house, to lock all the doors and windows, as this creature was not something we should mess with. We did all just that, and waited for what felt like hours, until we finally heard commotion outside, followed by silence, assuming it had just disappeared. As I look back now, I realize that this must have been one of those demonic spirits, or, again, a skinwalker, as you call it. It still makes me shiver to think about. My uncle prayed over our house so long and hard that night. My grandmother was a powerful witch, and she died the following year in her sleep. I'm sure something happened the night we encountered the creature, something none of us could ever explain or possibly understand. It's like it was in the house, like a dark cloud hovering over us, all until it eventually dissipated into nothingness. It's been years since then, and I still remember it as if it were yesterday. So every time I hear stories or read upon stories about these things, my mind often wanders back to that night, just trying to make sense of what really happened. I can only hope that no other family has to go through such a horror. But I learned then that sometimes... The things we fear most can also be the greatest teachers. Now I understand why my grandmother always believed in the power of darkness and spoke so highly of it. Why it was important for us all to pray over the house that night. It may seem strange, but I believe it's what she did in order to protect us from the evil forces beyond our mortal understanding. I've been an avid outdoorsman for most of my life. I grew up in the woods of northern New Jersey and spent most of my youth hunting, fishing, and camping. I served eight years in the army as a military policeman, then went to work for TSA at Newark Airport after that. I was always told growing up by my father and grandfather that if you see something scary, don't be afraid. They're not there to hurt you. The things only come around when someone in the family is going to die, such as an entity. Of course, I never believed them, but after seeing what I saw, I'm starting to believe them now. I live on Long Island. I have a small cabin in upstate New York, about an hour from where I work, actually which is only about 45 minutes, give or take, from the cabin. My wife and kids do not like the area I have the cabin in, so I never really go up there. But I try to go up there by myself or with friends a few times when I can, just to get away from everything, from the noise and complications and problems of life, and relax. I'm a big guy, and I like to be alone when I'm at my cabin, which is surrounded by about 10 acres of woods. It's actually not far from a small town, so people do hike, hunt, and fish around there, but it still is very secluded because of all the trees. I went up to my cabin just last weekend, around 11 p.m. Now, I'm a night owl, so that is my prime time to go up there and unwind. That's when everything happened. I was sitting on the back porch, which is off of the kitchen area, drinking some coffee. Yes, I drink coffee late at night to unwind, just listening to some Eric Clapton on my phone. It was very dark out. There was overcast with no moon or stars shining, at least that were not visible. There are a few small lights outside my cabin, but they do not light up the area enough for me to see more than 10 feet in front of me. I was sitting there for about 30 minutes when all of a sudden, from behind my cabin to the left, I hear this deep noise, a noise that I could feel. 
My first inkling was that somebody had broken into the cabin because the back door is glass and you can see right through it from outside. But there were no lights on inside or out, so I could not see anything yet. I grabbed my light off the table next to me, turned off my music, and listened for any other sounds around me. But I did not hear anything else at the time. I decided to go out to the front door and walk around back to see if I can find out what it was that made that loud noise. As I walked into the living room area of my cabin, I saw two glowing eyes staring at me through the glass on the door. This freaked me out because, well, it was dark out. I thought maybe it was a deer or something looking in at me. I opened the door, shined my flashlight down towards where I heard the noise coming from, but I didn't see anything. I walked around to the back of my cabin, still did not see anything. But as soon as I shined my flashlight towards where I heard the noise, these two glowing eyes stared right back at me from about ten feet away in a patch of grass. The creature stood up, taller than me by at least a foot or more. It had long black hair all over its body and the face that resembled a wolf, with sharper teeth, of course. I have a forty caliber pistol on my hip. But, because this thing was so close to me, I didn't want to try and shoot it with the risk of it hitting myself if I missed. So I took out my knife that was strapped to my leg, and I yelled at it, saying, Get away from me! It looked like it wanted to come after me, so I had no choice but to charge at it. I know, not one of my better moments. When I got within five feet of this thing... Whatever it was seemed to evaporate into a mist. I was shocked, scared. I fleed back to the cabin, locking every door, sitting inside, listening for any sounds outside, not sure what had just happened. The next morning, I somehow managed to stay awake all night, looking for anything. The next morning, once the sun rose, I went out around my cabin looking for tracks or anything that would tell me what this thing was, but there were none. All I could think of last night after it happened was Dogman, because of how tall it was compared to me, even though I'm 6'1". The only reason I'm talking about this is because of your stories and experiences you've posted over the years. I believe what my grandfather and father told me about the family secret being real was after seeing what I saw. The secret being that, like I told you, my families see entities, and when we do, they're usually seen as an omen. I hope that doesn't mean bad things for me. I'm a deer hunter, and I've seen some pretty strange things in the woods. I've had my fair share of weird experiences with bears, of course, but this was something entirely different. It was actually about two years ago, during the rut, when I saw something that looked like a strange creature stalking a buck. The time was around 6.30 in the morning, and I was heading to my tree stand. As I walked along an old logging road, about 50 yards from where I parked my truck, I heard something moving in the brush that was very large to my left. At first, it did not register what it could be because there aren't any wolves in this part of Idaho, and besides, it sounded too big to be a coyote or a dog. So naturally, of course, and being curious, I stopped to listen more intently. At first, there was silence for about 10 seconds. Then all of a sudden, this huge buck came running out of the brush on my left, followed by this strange upright creature. The buck ran right past me and kept going down the logging road while this thing just stood there looking at me for what seemed like forever, but was probably only about 10 to 20 seconds. It stood on its back legs pretty clearly, which put it almost as tall as me. For reference, I'm about 6'1", maybe 6'2". The way I can describe it is it had long, dark brown hair all over its body, except for its chest, which seemed to be more bare-skinned or dark in color. 
Its head was very large compared to its body, pointed ears that stuck straight up off its head, and large eyes that seemed to glow red when they caught the light just right. Its snout was shorter, kind of like a bear, but very, very wide, and large teeth exposed when it opened its mouth, which almost reminded me of a dog panting. When it finally turned away from me and started heading off into the brush on the other side, it hunched over on all fours, disappearing into the thick underbrush within seconds. No breaking branches, no leaves, just silent. The whole encounter probably took maybe five minutes from start to finish, and that's counting at the beginning of me getting out of my truck. Afterwards, I can't believe I was able to sit in my tree stand, but I did, just hoping that thing would not come and get me. I sat there for several hours trying not to think about what happened, but couldn't stop thinking about how real everything felt, including seeing that buck getting chased by, well, whatever that thing was. When daylight finally came around, I decided to stay a little later. And so finally, I decided to leave and go get breakfast at McDonald's. I don't know what exactly else happened that morning, but whatever it was, it wasn't normal. This story is a long one, but I'll do my best to try and keep things short. I was born in the late 1960s, grew up in a small town in Northern California. My parents divorced, and my mother remarried when I was around the age of 10. My stepfather was a very strange man. He had this morbid obsession with the occult and UFOs and the supernatural. He would often talk about that he believed aliens were here on Earth, but that they lived underground because they didn't want to be seen by humans. He also believed that these aliens were actually demons from hell who had come to Earth to deceive people into believing their lies. He told me that if I ever saw one of these beings, not to look at it directly, because they had the ability to hypnotize you and take over your mind. Now, I remember one night when we were driving home from a local restaurant at around 9 or so p.m., and we came upon a small car accident on the highway near our home. This was a considerable pileup involving several cars, but no one appeared injured as far as we could tell, since everybody seemed fine, or what we saw. Now, as we sat there in the car watching the scene unfold in front of us, this huge black figure materialized out of nowhere right next to our car. It reminded me of a tall man wearing a trench coat and having long flowing hair, and its eyes glowed like red fire. It just stood there staring at us for what seemed like forever, until my stepfather snapped back into reality and he floored it. We quickly arrived back at our house, which wasn't too far away, thankfully. Now, this was the family car we were driving, and my dad really needed repairs on his work truck, but I'll get to that in just a second. Even though we made it back home safely, this really shook my stepfather. I mean, he refused to go outside after that night, even though his truck was in desperate need of repair. Anyway, a few days later, he finally got the courage and took it to a local mechanic who often worked on his vehicles. A few months later, my stepfather passed away unexpectedly due to heart failure while working in his garden outside our home during the summertime. I'm now 50, living in another state with my husband and two children. To this day, I believe that what we saw that night on that highway was a demon of some kind. Growing up in rural New Mexico, I've experienced my fair share of strange occurrences. The vast expanse of the desert, with its secrets and mysteries, it has a way of drawing in the supernatural, or at least that's what my family believes. You see, over the years, I've encountered a series of inexplicable events that left me with a deep-rooted belief in the existence of skinwalkers. Here are just a few of those stories. I was just 12 when I first encountered something I couldn't explain. I was spending the night at my best friend Jake's house, located on the outskirts of town. His family owned a few acres of land, and their property backed up to a stretch of barren desert. One night, 
we decided to camp out in his backyard, telling stories and roasting marshmallows. As the night wore on, we began to hear strange noises coming from the darkness beyond the edge of our property. At first, we dismissed it as coyotes, but the sounds grew more unnerving, like a mix between a howl and this guttural noise. We nervously lapped it off, trying to convince ourselves that it was just our overactive imaginations. Suddenly, we spotted something moving in the darkness, tall and thin, with elongated limbs and a hunched back. We could see its eyes reflecting the moonlight, giving off a very eerie color. The figure approached. We scrambled back inside the house faster than you could say nope. We never spoke of it again. Now, fast forward to when I was 17. I was driving home late one night after hanging out with some friends. The road I took was a long, desolate stretch surrounded by desert all around. Nothing but the occasional scrub brush and tumbleweed to keep me company. As I drove, I noticed a shape darting across the road in front of me. I slammed on the brakes, thinking it was a deer or some other desert animal. But as my headlights illuminated the figure, this was no ordinary creature. It stood on two legs and had a twisted, almost human-like appearance. Its eyes glowed with this sickly green color. I floored the gas pedal, sped away. Now, again, in my early 20s, I became an avid hiker and camper, often exploring the remote wilderness with some close friends. On one such trip, we had made a camp in a secluded canyon, what I would consider far away from civilization. We spent the evening talking. As the night progressed, we began to hear a strange noise echoing through the canyon. It sounded like a cross between a scream and a laugh, chilling us all to the bone. The atmosphere quickly became tense as we all listened to the unsettling sounds. A figure, eerily similar to the one from my childhood, emerged from the shadows, circling our campsite just beyond the reach of the light never coming too close, but never straying too far. We remained huddled together, too terrified to sleep until the first light of dawn drove this thing away. That's about all I have for my current experiences. I'm sorry if it's not much, but I've been dealing with this for years now, and I feel like I'm being hunted by the same entity in which I've been telling you about. Any help you could offer is greatly appreciated. I've had a handful of sightings that I can't quite explain. They all took place on my grandfather's farm while growing up. I'm in my late 20s now, but these took place from the age of 9 to 15. My grandfather's farm was located in a rural area surrounded by dense forests and rolling hills. It was the perfect setting for strange occurrences and unexplained sightings. The first sighting occurred when I was just nine years of age. My cousin and I were playing near the edge of the forest, not too terribly far from the house. We were playing hide-and-seek, and it was my turn to find... I heard some rustling in the bushes nearby. Thinking it was my cousin, I crept closer, continuing our game. However, as I got closer, the rustling grew louder, and instantly I stopped in my tracks and stared. This black, hairy hand shot out from the bush and nearly tried to grab me. I screamed, and what emerged from the bushes was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood about seven feet tall, very massive, very muscular. Its face resembled a man, well, kind of, but they were yellow and large, and they almost seemed to glow. 
It stood on two legs like a human, but kind of had the hind quarters of an animal. It had a long tail that swayed slowly behind it. I froze. I was unable to move or even scream. It looked down at me, almost surprised at how small I was compared to it. I can vividly remember the expression on its face. It was wearing a frown. It turned and looked up and walked off, just ever so casually. Once I was able to regain movement, I fled back to the house with tears streaming down my face, completely terrified out of my mind. I told my grandparents, which, by the way, they listened really good to me. And my grandfather tried his best to console me and to calm me down, and he listened to me. But he couldn't provide any explanation for what I had encountered. Over the years, I somehow gathered the courage to go back out there and play more, and I would not have another experience again till around 12 years old. I had a few more sightings. Each time, it was a similar creature, I think, because that first one was the only time I ever saw it up close. The other times, I'm pretty sure it would appear near the edge of the woods in a large field nearby, usually around dusk, and then vanish. When I was around 15, the most terrifying encounter occurred. It was late in the summer, and I decided to take a walk around the property before heading to bed. I approached the same open field that is surrounded by trees on all sides. This is a long-gone alfalfa field, and I say that jokingly. My grandfather used to grow alfalfa here for many years, but due to some medical conditions he faced, he just had to cut it out because he couldn't maintain it anymore. And now... It just sat as empty fields. And as I'm walking along, I get this feeling that there's eyes on me. And I turn in response, and I'm paralyzed. I could see this large, hulking figure, or what it appeared at the time, was more like a shadow making its way up to the tree line. The only light I saw were these amber glowing eyes coming from it. I was overcome with fear and I could do nothing but stand there as it slowly approached. It stopped just feet away, its hot breath visible. For a moment, it seemed as if time stood still, and without warning, it let out this ear-piercing howl that echoed through the night, before continuing to move in the direction it was going, just further into the tree line. I used that opportunity to sprint back to the house, my heart pounding in my chest. At this time, my older cousin, the same one that I was playing with back when I was nine, well, he was a few years older than I, and he was not home. It was just me. I can tell you that afterwards, I stopped venturing out alone on the farm, especially after dark. As I look back, I don't know what this creature was or why it seemed to be drawn to me. However, this encounter has left me with a deep respect for the unknown. Of course, it scared me out of my wits, but sometimes they really make you wonder, what if? In 1992, I was employed by the Forest Service in Montana. During one of my routine patrols, I encountered something that has remained etched in my memory for the entirety of my life. It was a cool fall evening, and I was walking through a dense section of woods near the edge of our designated patrol area. At this point in the evening, the sun had already well dipped below the horizon line, and twilight was gradually giving way to darkness. Now, as an experienced ranger, I felt quite comfortable navigating this familiar terrain, even as daylight faded away. As I continued on my path, I suddenly heard an unusual rustling sound coming from a nearby bush off to my left-hand side. My initial thought was that it was probably a deer 
or some other common woodland animal. However, what emerged from those bushes completely would defy all logic and reasoning. What stepped out into view appeared to be an enormous canine-like creature standing upright on its hind legs. It looked so natural. It must have stood at least eight to nine feet tall. I'm talking jet black fur covering its entire body, except for a few patches around its eyes and snout, which seemed to be a light smoky gray color. Its eyes were a eerie yellowish green. They were piercing. I remember its snout and ears and how pointed and sharp they seemed. Even its arms were incredibly muscular. The hands ending in sharp claws. But perhaps the most striking feature was the sheer size. While it was incredibly tall, it was also stocky and wide. I cannot believe a canine could grow so massive. What I was looking at, it was like a real living werewolf. Frozen in shock and fear, but was probably only a few seconds, I began to reach for my sidearm, which was just a standard issue 9mm pistol we carried. As if sensing my intentions or perhaps seeing the movement from the corner of its own eye, this thing let out a snarl that resonated deep within me. You could feel the bass from this thing. Imagine for a second, an actual lion roaring about 10 feet away from you. A growl so deep you could feel it reverberate from your insides. That's how this was. Before I even had time to properly aim at it or even fire off a shot, this monstrous being suddenly dropped down to all fours, making a wet popping sound as it did so and sprinted back into the dense underbrush from where it came. Its movements were incredibly fast and agile, and once it disappeared, it was gone. I stood there not even knowing what to think. I tried to comprehend what had just transpired. It took me minutes to regain any composure I had before moving on with my patrol. I didn't want to, but I had to. I was constantly scanning my surroundings and the area for any signs that this thing was going to attack me. But nothing. I never saw it. I did return to the base later that night, and I debated whether or not to report this to my superiors, but... I ultimately decided against it for fear they would dismiss me as delusional, or worse yet, label me unfit for duty due to mental instability. Instead, I confided only in a few trusted friends over time who would share similar unexplained experiences while working deep within these same forests. In speaking with others since then about their own encounters with strange creatures throughout the wilderness, like bipedal canines, for example, like the one I saw back in the evening of 1992, I have come to believe that these creatures may indeed be a species yet unknown to science. Skeptics might argue that such sightings are merely misidentifications or even a product of an overactive imagination. Those of us who have had first-hand encounters with these, whatever they are, beings, I guess, we know the truth. Something extraordinary is truly calling our forests home. Not my story, but actually my grandfather. He's been a park ranger for a long time, and he's told me about an encounter he had with something strange. Now, he's not one to believe in supernatural things or legends and folklore, so when I heard this story from him, it genuinely affected me. He was out small game hunting after his work shift had ended on a day roughly 13 years ago. It was later in the afternoon dusky conditions were setting in. 
as an experienced outdoorsman who knows how to handle himself around wildlife, and even occasional poachers, he rarely ever finds himself feeling vulnerable. But that day was different. He was moving along a trail when he heard something large moving. Now, he wasn't too concerned initially because the noise continued and seemed to grow closer to him while also maintaining a parallel course with his own path. This is when he couldn't help but feel an increasing sense of unease. He described how he eventually wanted to find out what it was, so he stopped moving forward entirely for just a few moments. He was hoping that he could catch a glimpse of whatever was causing the noise. Then he heard a sound that seemed uncharacteristic of any animal in the region, almost as if someone was speaking. Feeling both startled and somewhat threatened, my grandfather took several steps back while gripping his hunting rifle tightly. He had never experienced anything like this before. An unknown entity whose threatening presence approached without fear or hesitation. He recalled it as incredibly sinister. He called out with caution, but received no reply other than an eerie sound, sort of like a roar, which now sounded closer than ever. As the tension heightened, my grandfather took a strategic position behind a large tree trunk, staying as quiet as possible. His heart pounding heavily, he was barely able to breathe. And out of the growing darkness emerged this towering figure. It was covered in what appeared to be black. It sprinted open clearing with an extraordinary speed for something so massive looking. Its most defining features, though, were its high-placed ears and long white fangs, lining its elongated muzzle. My grandfather couldn't believe what he was seeing. Here was a creature that resembled the impossible mix of a wolf and man, moving with both agility and coordination on its back legs. The beast briefly paused in the clearing, before disappearing into another section of brushwood at an astonishing speed. My grandfather stayed frozen behind his tree for several more moments, listening intently, but hearing no further evidence of this creature's presence. Eventually, once it quieted down enough, he was able to leave his spot and head back towards his track, but couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that he felt as if he was being followed. Fortunately, he was able to make it back home. Now, he only shared this encounter with a few of his close friends. My grandfather has not encountered this being or anything like it ever again, nor has any sound evidence appeared within park grounds to support its existence. Nonetheless, those who trust him have no doubt about the authenticity something truly out of the ordinary happened. To this day, he does remain cautious and vigilant whenever he's in those woods after dark, always wondering if he'll encounter the mysterious once more. He has no idea what it could have been or why it was there, but is convinced it wasn't a figment of his imagination or simply a misidentified animal. I hope this story finds you well. I am writing to share with you my recent encounter in the Allegheny National Forest, which has left me with an experience I can never forget. My name is John, or so you can call me. I'm an experienced hiker and camper, I guess you could say. I've been exploring various national forests for well over 10 years now, and have encountered various wildlife, but nothing could have prepared me for what I experienced on my latest trip. You see, I've always been fascinated with the idea of Bigfoot and have read countless articles and books on said topic, but I never really believed in their existence 
until I had my own personal encounter. I set out on my trip to the Allegheny National Forest, a place I've been to several times before, and the day was perfect, a beautiful day for a hike. I packed my gear, hit the trail, eager to immerse myself in the beauty of all that surrounded me. As I hiked, I couldn't help but feel a strange presence following me, but I brushed it off as my imagination just getting the best of me. Perhaps I was paranoid that day. However, I continued on my journey, the feeling only growing stronger. I stopped in my tracks and listened intently, but all I could hear was the sound of leaves rustling in the wind. I shrugged it off and continued on my way, but the feeling of being watched only intensified. I decided to set up my camp for the night, but could not shake the feeling that I was being followed. I tried to keep my mind occupied by reading and cooking dinner, but I couldn't help but keep glancing over my shoulder. It was then, at one point, I had heard a loud thud coming from some brush. Immediately, I grabbed my flashlight, shone it in the direction of the noise. To my shock, I saw a figure standing there. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. If I had to guess, I would say at least seven feet tall, covered in thick matted fur, massive build. Its eyes were piercing. I could even see the whites of its eyes shining in the darkness. Not that it was, of course, emitting light, but that's what it was like. It stood there for a few moments, looking at me, and then vanishing into the bushes behind it. I was stunned, and it took me a moment to gather my thoughts. I realized I was not safe. Immediately, I packed up my gear, hiking out in the middle of the night as quickly as I could. I never did shake the feeling that I was being followed, but I didn't dare to look back. Now, this encounter has left me with a mixture of fear and awe. I'm still trying to process what I saw and just make sense of it. I will always be a skeptic, and I still am, but there's a part of me now that's more of a believer than ever before. I think a lot of it has to do with just, I can't quite process that that actually happened. Anyways, thank you for taking the time to read this. I hope this submission will help contribute to the ongoing investigation into the existence of the dark and the strange. Thank you. I live in a small town in southern New York. My house is on a hill facing west, with a nice view of the town and the rolling hills. My home is also near a trail that runs alongside the hill and connects to a park in the middle of town. Recently, I found a few podcasts I really enjoy, which I'm loving by the way and inspired me to send this email about something weird that I recently experienced. I've lived in this house for almost an entire year now, and up until the last couple of weeks have had zero weird experiences. My house is on a dead-end road, but I rarely hear or see any traffic, even though there's a highway not too far away. Anyway, my dog has been acting up lately. She is a lab pit mix, and I got as a puppy almost three years now, and is very friendly, social, especially with dogs. She will often bark at people walking or jogging by, but will stop and eventually run up to them. She is also very protective of the house, her yard, and me. Now here's the weird part. She has been growling at thin air a lot lately. I mean, a lot. Like, almost every other night. She calms down eventually, but not before barking and lunging at thin air for like 15 minutes straight. I have also seen something standing in my yard staring at me through my back window. This is when I'm in bed watching TV late at night. The first time it happened, I was kind of freaked out. I grabbed a baseball bat, opening up the blinds to get a better look. 
since it's only about 10 feet from my bed. When I looked over, all I could see, now bear with me here, was what looked like an eight foot tall black dog with red eyes staring back at me. We probably stared each other down for five minutes until eventually it just turned around, walked off and disappeared into the dark shadows. A week later, it happened again, but this time it turns around to leave its face coming into view. Its head is huge. It even has what appeared to be horns or antlers coming from its head and even teeth. Oh, I forgot to mention that instead of fur, it appeared to have scales of some kind. I really have no idea what it is I'm dealing with. Any answers would be much appreciated. I'd like to share a frightening experience that I had just a few years ago. Although it wasn't on the Navajo reservation, it did occur on another tribal land. Years ago, two inexplicable events took place that have left me just completely blown away and unsettled. They were identical in every respect, and I've never found a satisfactory explanation for their occurrence. I'm not sure if you're interested in these types of stories, but I assumed I'd share them with you anyway. The first incident occurred in the summer of 2005. My wife and I were living up on the Fort Apache Reservation here in Arizona. We had just moved into a new house located right on the outskirts. The house was situated at the end of a long dirt road running through some pockets of dense forestation. It was, for the most part, very secluded, very private. We liked that a lot. It allowed us to enjoy our privacy, and I mean, who doesn't enjoy their privacy? We wouldn't have to worry about nosy neighbors or prying eyes. One night, my wife and I were sitting outside on our front porch, enjoying the cool evening air. We heard something moving around inside our yard. We thought it might be a deer or some other animal. We didn't think much about it until we heard what sounded like footsteps crunching across the gravel leading right up to our house. We both looked at each other, puzzled expressions wore on our faces. We tried to figure out what could be making those sounds. It's clear there were no vehicles parked nearby and nobody else, since the gate is locked down at the entrance, should have been able to be up here walking around, especially now at night. I reached for my pistol, which I kept on me, and slowly approached the driveway with my flashlight in hand. And let me tell you, I was ready to blast anything that might be lurking around. I shined the light around, but didn't see anything. And then we both heard more footsteps, but this time running away from us. Whatever it was, it sounded clearly like two legs and not four. It also made a strange grunting noise as whoever or whatever it was took off very quickly. We stood there for a moment trying to figure out what it could have been. And then we heard a sound that made my blood run cold. It sounded like a woman, but she was crying, and it was definitely coming from the forest. It was a very mournful and pitiful sound. It sounded like it might have come from a woman who was in great pain or distress. I told my wife, we need to get inside right now. The sound reminded me of something I heard in Mexico when I got lost in the desert, but that's another story for another time. I didn't want to find out what might be lurking around our property, so I hurried back inside, locking the doors. I called the police, and they'd said they'd come investigate. In the time while waiting, we sat awake, just listening for any sounds anything to indicate what might have been outside. 
but it was dead silent. Not even the crickets were singing their usual songs. When the officer arrived about 12 minutes after the call, I told him everything. The footsteps, the crying sound. He seemed concerned, but he also seemed to believe us. He told us he would go take a look. He shined his flashlight around, looked out back, but after about a 20-minute search of the perimeter, he didn't see anything. So he just assumed it might have been an animal or probably some kids playing a prank on us. Anyway, he gave us his card in case it continued. We both knew that wasn't true, though, because there were no kids around our house. No teenagers, mind you. And I was pretty sure this wasn't a regular animal. I mean, we had never heard or saw anything else that night. So we just chalked it up to an animal and decided to move on with life after debating what it could have been. Now, the second incident occurred about two months later, now in the fall of 2005. If I remember correctly, it was roughly 9.30 at night. We were once again sitting outside on the front porch. We were having a nice little talk about our day and watching the stars when we heard the same footsteps and crying sounds from the previous couple months. This time, it was much louder and seemed far more intense. It sounded like it was coming from the forest 50 yards to the south. We both got up in reaction, running inside. But this time, we didn't hear any sounds. Everything seemed to immediately quiet down. I told my wife that I was going to go investigate and see once and for all what was behind it. She seemed incredibly frightened and did not hide it. She attempted to talk me out of it, but I insisted that this needed to be done and I had to know. I had to know because it had scared both of us. She reluctantly agreed. I grabbed my pistol and flashlight, searching outside. The crying was still audible, but it seemed to be coming from a different area than before, like it was moving. I kept shining it around, but couldn't see anything. So, I decided to go deeper into the forest, where we thought the sound was coming from, in order to get a better idea of what it might have been. When I got to the forest, I didn't hear anything, but I could still hear the crying coming from a distance. It sounded like it was now coming in the direction as one of the mountains near the reservation. The crying continued for about 15 minutes, then stopped as abruptly as it had started. After that, we didn't see or hear anything else that night. So after not finding anything, no tracks, no evidence of anybody being out there, I just went back inside. My wife and I were both too wound up, so we sat up most of the night, listening in case something happened. No, I did not call the police officer back. We never heard anything else. It's truly something so strange and bizarre, I really have no way to explain it away. Anytime I've gone into those woods since this happened, I just get the utter creeps, and I feel like something is looking at me. This is the most unbelievable account of a sighting that I have ever heard and I'm humbled to be able to tell it. A lady came to me recently, and before I knew it, we were lost in conversation, and she was telling me all about her encounter with the unknown. She stated that during an early summer evening in 1993, she had gone out on her front porch to watch the sunset as she was sitting down with a glass of red wine, when all at once... There were about 15 or 20 bright lights appearing in the sky above her house and all around her property. She said she thought it was the police at first, not really sure how to rationalize this sudden explosion of light, but then noticed they were not moving or making any noise whatsoever. 
She stood up out of fear when she noticed that the lights were not moving, then looked down to see if she could pick up any reflection of light. She states that when her eyes came back up towards the area where the lights were, she noticed there were now several strange crafts all around and appeared to be flying beings moving around. Incredibly frightened, she ran to her house, locking all the doors behind her. She then went to a window in an upstairs bedroom to try and get a better look, hiding in the safety of her home. She stated that when she looked out the window, there were beings by her trees in front of her house, as well as by her vehicles in the driveway. She explained they were extremely tall, very muscular, and pale-skinned, with what appeared to be dark hair on their bodies. She became even more frightened before she realized they were looking in her windows and walking around now. She then ran down to the first floor of the house into the dining room and became even more frightened when she realized they were trying to get in the house. She states that she could not tell if they were male or female, but just knew that there was something different about them other than their height and physical appearance. Incredibly scared, not knowing where else to turn, she sat down at the table and began to pray. She said once she did this, all the beings disappeared into thin air. She ran right back to the upstairs to look out the other window and saw that the crafts and the beings had all but vanished. She sat up in her bed all night long, watching out her window for any signs of them returning, but she never did. She said that she went to the sheriff's office about her sighting, but was told that there were no reports of any strange lights or aircrafts in the area. She said she is convinced otherwise, but will never be able to prove what she saw. She is also a very religious woman, and said that if it was the devil or his demons who came for her, then God must want something from her, because they have come back to bother her several times since this first encounter. She believes it is a test of faith, and I convinced her not to be afraid, because God was with her the whole time. She seemed somewhat comforted by that. I asked her if she would be willing to tell me the details of what happened, and after some convincing from my side, she was glad to share it with me. It was a humbling experience, and I'm convinced there is something other than us out there. Yellowstone National Park is a beautiful place, but sometimes it can get a bit spooky. As a park ranger, I have seen and experienced a lot over my time there. But one experience in particular still haunts me to this very day. One night, I was patrolling the park when I came across a strange light in the distance that I could not quite identify. At first, I presumed it might be a campfire, judging by the color and how it looked. But as I approached closer, I realized that it was coming from a small adobe house on the side of a cliff. The light was flickering as if it was a candle, but it was much brighter than a candle would be, obviously judging by the distance, so I approached the house carefully, but I couldn't see inside. Anyway, I gave up after some time. But the next day, I went back to that same spot with a colleague to check out this location. But to my surprise, there was no house there, only boulders, sand, and weeds. My colleague and I were both very confused. I mean, we couldn't figure out what he had seen the night before. Oh, quick side note. He had also told me that he too had seen the same thing from where he was. Now anyway... Years later, I was talking to a fellow ranger who had actually grown up in the area, unlike me, and he had told me about this supposed legend of a witch house that would sometimes show up miraculously in Yellowstone. Now, according to him, the area where I had seen the adobe house was known for being a place where witches gathered, and there was a small adobe house on the cliffside. He had heard stories of people seeing the house lit up at night, and that supposedly dark magic rituals would happen. But it was so small that it was almost impossible to see during the day or unless you were at the right location. 
I still don't know what I saw that night, but the experience has stayed with me. And to this day, I always feel a shiver run down my spine when I think about the words witch house in Yellowstone. And as a ranger in Yellowstone, or as a previous ranger, I've also heard many stories and legends from my colleagues and other rangers who have worked in the park for many years. It's a very common thing to swap stories with fellow rangers. In fact, one of the more intriguing and unusual stories I've heard involves large wolf-like creatures that some say roam the backcountry here in Yellowstone. Now, before you get freaked out, according to some other veteran rangers, these creatures are bipedal, standing upright on two legs, and are much more larger and violent than any normal wolf. They are often described as having long, shaggy fur, glowing eyes that seem to illuminate in the darkness itself. Now, some of the stories, if you read them, are downright terrifying, and they suggest that these creatures are not just wolves, but have almost a human-level intelligence. Some suggest they are actually shapeshifters that can take on human form or animal form. Now, over the years, there have been numerous reports of these creatures being spotted in the backcountry and in various campsites, but often in the more remote and isolated areas where humans and tourists rarely venture to. The reports that I've personally seen will usually describe these as being incredibly fast and agile, with a strength and agility that clearly defies any explanation. In fact, some of the stories even suggest that these creatures are actually responsible for attacks on animals and sometimes humans in the park, even missing persons. Although such incidents are few and far between. Remember, these are just theories, and despite these stories, there is little hard evidence to support such existence of a mysterious creature, let alone evidence like pictures and video. Now, some rangers believe that they are simply the result of folklore and legend, and sometimes your fear can actually manifest things. Others believe that they may be real, and they simply remain elusive and unseen. But... Regardless of their origins, these stories add to the allure and mystique of the fear that many experience at Yellowstone, and who knows of all the secrets it holds within its boundaries. And one of the creepiest encounters I've heard from a fellow retired ranger who worked in Yellowstone actually had a very strange occurrence in the backcountry, closer to Old Faithful, I'm told. The ranger, who had been working at the park for about 20 years at this point, claimed that one summer night, she was on patrol when she came up to a group of tourists huddled together. They were all visibly shaken and pale. Now, she told them that they had seen something in the woods that defied explanation. The ranger was skeptical but curious and ventured into the woods with a flashlight to investigate. Now, as she made her way deeper into the tree line, she suddenly recalls hearing this guttural growling noise that seemed to be coming from all around her. Now, she quickly realized that she was surrounded by a pack of large wolves, but as these beings showed themselves, she quickly realized that these were no ordinary wolves, that these creatures stood on two legs and were twice the size of a regular wolf with glowing eyes and a menacing growl. She tried to back away slowly, but these closed in on her, their growling crescendoing louder and more threatening. As she got ready to draw her weapon, suddenly, these beings almost seemed to just disappear into thin air, or as she described it, evaporate like a thick, wispy mist in front of her. The ranger, shocked and shook, made her way back to the tourist, who reported that they too had seen the exact same creatures. Now, this retired ranger, whose name I won't mention out of respect for her, never forgot about the strange encounter, and had told the story to several of us. Now, she had said that she too had heard similar stories from other rangers over the years, going far back many, many years, but believed that these wolf-like creatures were some sort of supernatural beings that had roamed Yellowstone. Now, despite her credibility and consistency in the story, the National Park Service has, of course, never officially acknowledged the existence of these strange cryptids. But for those of us who have worked in the park or work in national parks, 
The tales of these supernatural beings in the backcountry of Yellowstone specifically do serve as a reminder of the wild and untamed spirit that still exists in the lands. I've also heard many stories from different sources and different cultures about supernatural creatures and magic. And I have to admit, I'm an atheist, and I don't believe in things like skinwalkers or black magic, but with the tribes and other cultures, I do try to keep an open mind. It's possible that there might be some connection between the Navajo culture and the idea of shape-shifting and skinwalkers. I've actually had a chance to speak to some of the elders and spiritual leaders of a local tribe, and they claim that shapeshifters and magic practitioners are real. In fact, the Dark Ones have the power to not only change people's minds, but curse them, and also change into different animals, including wolves. And there are also stories about how skinwalkers, and I use that definition loosely as just a black magic practitioner who can shapeshift for malicious purposes, they can put curses on people, as I've said. And some of my colleagues, who are much more open-minded than me, have claimed to see strange, large wolf-like creatures, as I've said, in the backcountry area. In any case, it's my job to keep people safe and provide them with information about the park and its history even if it is a bit spooky at times. I try to encourage people to keep an open mind and respect the local cultures and beliefs, even if they are different from our own. At the time of writing this, I will always try to remind people to be safe and to never go wandering into the backcountry or off trails without proper equipment and knowledge of the area. Thank you so much for letting me share this with you. I hope it finds you well. Our next story comes from Ted a park ranger who had worked in the Monument Valley National Park in the 1980s. Ted had this to say, As a park ranger at the Monument Valley National Park in the 1980s, I was privileged to witness the breathtaking beauty of the valley on a almost daily basis. During my time at the park, I was struck by the unique geological formations that dotted the barren landscape, each one a testament to the forces of nature that shaped this magnificent land. One evening, I was making my rounds, and drawn to the eerie silence that descended upon the valley after sunset. I decided to take a walk along the ridgeline that overlooked the valley, enjoying the peacefulness of the night enjoying every bit of solace I could get. As I strolled, I noticed a strange flickering light in the distance that almost seemed to be dancing. It seemed to be moving at an odd pace, and I couldn't quite make out what was causing it. I began to investigate and began to make my way towards the source of the light. Now, as I approached, I realized the light was not coming from a singular source, but rather seemed to be emanating from the entire valley. I was shocked to see that the valley below was aglow with an ethereal light, as if it were illuminated from within. I quickly deduced that the source of the light was a phenomenon known as earth lights, an electrical discharge from the ground caused by the interaction of subterranean rock strata. It was a rare and fascinating sight, and I felt fortunate to have witnessed it. I remained at the valley for several hours, studying the earth lights and observing their movements. As the night progressed, the valley returned to its normal dark state, and the earth lights vanished as if they had never been there. To this day, it's one of the most memorable, bizarre nights of my career. The experience only reinforced my belief that the natural world holds many mysteries and wonders that are yet waiting to be discovered that I personally believe coincide with the supernatural. Now, I can recall a similar experience during that same time frame. It was a clear winter night, and I was on patrol making my rounds in the park. And this is when I heard a strange, almost human-like howling coming from the direction of spires. It was a sound that I had never heard before, even in my younger years of working in and around the park. Curious, I decided to investigate further, and I made my way towards the source of the noise, my flashlight illuminating the path ahead of me. And as I got closer, the howls became more frequent and intense. I was cautious, knowing that the park was home to many flora, fauna, and wildlife species that 
could potentially be dangerous if approached too closely. Suddenly, I saw a large, shadowy figure moving among the spires. I shone my light on it, and what I saw still haunts me. It was a wolf, but not like any wolf I had ever seen before. It was massive, a coat of fur that glimmered in the moonlight. Its eyes glowed a brilliant ruby red, and its howls were almost human-like. Now, before you write me off, I stood there frozen, watching as this thing grimaced at me almost with a human-like expression. I was too stunned to move and too frightened to continue any investigation I had originally set out to do. I eventually was able to run back to the patrol car, reporting my strange sighting to my superiors. Fortunately, whatever being this was did not follow me, and to this day I still wonder what I saw that night in Monument Valley National Park. What I can say is my superiors quickly shot me down and told me I shouldn't be openly talking about this sort of thing. To be honest with you, I try my best not to talk about it because it was terrifying and it's not something I enjoy thinking back on. And our last story comes from an ex-search and rescue personnel who had worked around and in Yosemite National Park. Yosemite National Park is a rugged and beautiful area. And we've seen all sorts of emergencies, from lost hikers to injured climbers, and we're generally ready for just about anything. But today, I'm sharing with you a bizarre set of stories that I've kept to myself over the years because many people would probably call me crazy if I decided to share them. And you seem like a fitting outlet to share these with. So, here I go. One day... We had received a call about a missing hiker in the park. The hiker was an older gentleman, and he had gone out on a solo hike, despite warnings from fellow park rangers, because at this point the weather was very bad. The conditions were treacherous, to say the least. Heavy rain and strong winds battering the mountains. And unfortunately, he decided to carry on and become a statistic. So we geared up, gathered our team, and headed out. Now, as we searched for this young man, I couldn't shake the feeling that this situation was all too familiar. It was like I was reliving that moment from years past, when one of my neighbors had gone missing. Now, we searched high and low, but the rain and wind were making it incredibly difficult. The terrain was rough at best, and it seemed like we were getting nowhere. But then we spotted something, a small, bright orange tent. And as we approached, we saw the missing hiker inside, shivering and wet. We quickly got him out and there into one of our rescue vehicles. On the way back to the park, I couldn't help but think about the similarities between this hiker and somebody who was very close to me. As we pulled in, the man looked at me and said, Thank you for finding me. I never thought I'd make it out of there alive. I smiled and I could still remember his gruff face and the way he looked at me in the eyes that day. And what he shared with me, personally, terrified me. He explained that he was chased off the trail by, in his words, a tribe of wild, hairy men with primitive weapons. In fact, they had chased him miles and miles, nearly killing him until he had found solace in a tiny valley where he managed to stay safe despite the rough terrain and weather conditions. Now, to my knowledge, there is no group or posse of wild, hairy men around the Yosemite Valley, but now these kinds of things make me wonder. He seemed very sincere and sounded like he had no real reason to lie. Another story I'd like to share with you was during my time as a search and rescue as well, But this night, what I had saw that night was completely different. It wasn't a bear, and it wasn't anything I'd ever seen before. The way it moved, the way it kept up with my truck, it was like nothing I'd ever even imagined. It even caused me to start paying more attention to my surroundings, the obvious signs I began seeing in the forest. A perfect example would be finding uprooted saplings, tree trunks, and roots stuck into the ground upside down, carefully arranged in identical stones and patterns. I had a feeling that I was being watched from time to time and that I was not alone. 
Now, I personally carried a loaded 9mm pistol anytime I was out in the wilderness, and so far I've been left alone, but you just never know. This isn't technically a story, it's more something that's been ongoing. Now, the very last thing I wanted to share, I guess you could say fast forward a couple of years, and I found myself on a very treacherous search and rescue mission. We had received a distress signal from a group of hikers who had gotten lost. This is all within Yosemite National Park. As we made our way through a very dense patch of forest, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had experienced this sometime before, like this crazy deja vu. And then it hit me. I began to notice the forest around me and my partners completely change as if we were in a completely different time period. The vegetation became more dense, the sky grew overcast, but what was most surprising was the sights and smells that surrounded us. There appeared to be a small, almost medieval-style village out in the open and no sign of modern civilization from just a few moments ago. We clearly saw villagers dressed in traditional clothing from what looked to be around the 1500 to 1600 AD era, and they were in the middle of some kind of celebration. Fortunately, or unfortunately, they did not see us, and I think I'm the one that realized this, but did, did we step back in time? We tried to make our way back to our starting point, not exactly sure what was going on, and fortunately... We were able to go back the way we came, and it appeared that we had made our way back to, dare I say, our time. But the only thing I could think is that we had somehow went through a portal, or I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, because going back that way the following day, we encountered no such small civilization of people dressed from that time era. And all three of us saw and experienced the exact same thing. All the details corroborated perfectly. I understand that this sounds incredibly science fiction, but there's a reason I don't share this story with many people. It's oftentimes made me contemplate, am I crazy? Am I hallucinating? Did I make this up? And then I always remember that there's three of us who experienced the same thing. For my understanding and personal research, I've only come across several other accounts that were posted publicly of people going through what many describe as time portals or portals in general, where they experience strange phenomenon and different things. So I'm assuming that's what I experienced and saw, but I can't be too sure. As far as the distress signal from the missing group of hikers, they were eventually found about three days later. But as far as the strange time portal that all three of us went into, I have nothing to explain that. Ever since I was a little girl, my parents loved taking long drives and exploring obscure destinations all throughout the United States, from historical sites to hidden gems in dense unknown forests they were always on the lookout for new adventures. Not surprisingly, then, that once I grew up, while pursuing landscape architecture as my profession, wandering off the beaten path became second nature than just leisure activity. Last weekend turned out to be one such eventful episode from these many travels, exclusively memorable because of what happened there. It so transpired that we decided to travel northwards along eastern Hudson River Valley. We had heard stories about the area being rich in nature and history, so naturally, we couldn't wait to see what it held. We decided to stay at a cozy little bed and breakfast, tucked away amidst tall trees for our weekend adventure getaway. Our goal was to hike through nearby trails during daytime while soaking up some local culture and visiting quaint townships close by when nightfall swept over us. On Saturday evening, after an enjoyable time exploring Hollow Brook Trailhead, my husband, Paul, who is also passionate about photography, managed capturing wild deer 
numerous birds, and the greenery-filled landscapes at its picturesque best. We returned to our accommodation, tired but satisfied with what had been an amazing day. After a pleasant meal from our host that night, Paul suggested visiting Wappinger Creek Bridge, an old abandoned trail near a college, early next morning before heading home. The next day dawned bright, without even the slightest indication of having coffee jitters. Everything seemed just so perfect. We drove up to the parking area not far away from campus as the sun's first rays began dispersing, darkness around us gradually turning into shadows. Armed with our cameras and high spirits, we embarked upon the path which led to the creek bridge, or whatever remained of it after years of unkempt abandonment. As we neared closer towards the dilapidated iron bridge that had definitely seen better days in its prime, rusted beams overgrown beneath choking foliage, twisted reinforcement exposing decay within rather than brave resistance fighting time's ravages. Somehow, this sense grew stronger about some unseen presence watching us, intently from afar throughout the entire hike until now. It felt unsettling, but neither one dared admitting something didn't add up about this place. As we cautiously stepped onto the bridge, an unsettling silence seemed to envelop us, we began snapping away pictures of anything that caught our eye, and it was at that moment when things went off kilter. A sudden chilling gust blew across us from seemingly nowhere, catching both by surprise. Paul's wide-brimmed hat, which protected him against sunlight, took flight while my scarf clung tightly around my throat, quivering with every intense draft wreaking havoc upon its delicate fabric folds, before finally settling back down where it once belonged, albeit tangled messily in aftermath left behind by an invisible intruder who had just invaded our otherwise peaceful surroundings. It was then we realized, eyes locked on each other in that eerie quietness. Something far more sinister looked nearby, a sudden movement at the edge of my peripheral vision revealed what seemed like two slender figures emerging from abandoned structures adjacent to the bridge. Their appearance resonated with descriptions associated with fable chupacabra. Our hearts raced as these beings darted towards us rapidly, long limbs extending out almost similar to an octopus's appendages. Just as we're about to scream, panic-stricken and unsure of what would happen next, something miraculous occurred. The first rays of morning sun breached the foliage canopy above us, casting its warm glow directly onto these bizarre creatures that had now reached striking distance from our trembling forms. Yet, within seconds, they vanished right before our disbelieving eyes. It appeared that sunlight somehow vanquished their very essence, Paul and I, clutching each other tightly in shock at what we had just witnessed. Were it not for a timely intervention from the sun's reassuring presence shining down upon us, wondered how this seemingly innocent hike could have escalated so violently. Were these famed cryptids stalking our every move? What drew them to humanity? as if it's still reeling under the stupor induced by such an inexplicable encounter, we made haste in gathering belongings which lay scattered carelessly where previously abandoned due to fear. As if still reeling under stupor induced by such an inexplicable encounter, and with that, we scrambled back to our car and drove away. The soon-to-be-forgotten memories of the creek bridge dissolved. Warmest regards... Claire and Paul. I hope this message finds you well. I've been a long-time follower of your work, and have always found it fascinating. But never in my wildest dreams did I think that one day 
I would be writing to share an experience of my very own. My name is John, and for the sake of anonymity, let's just say I live in a rural area somewhere within the United States. My wife's family has owned land here for generations. They're farmers by trade, so we often visit them during holiday season or whenever our busy schedules allow us some free time to run off out of the city. It's always a welcome change of pace, and we do enjoy the peace and quiet that comes with being surrounded in nature. However, this particular incident occurred during one such visit to my in-law's house about two years ago in 2017. I remember it was late summer, early September, if my memory serves me right. The leaves had not started changing just yet, so it was probably September. The days were also still warm, and the nights had begun to cool down. We'd been there for almost a week already, spending our time catching up with family members who lived nearby or helping out on their farm as needed. On this evening, after dinner, it was probably closer to 9 p.m. I decided it would be a good idea to head into town to get some supplies that we needed. My wife stayed behind with her parents and siblings as they were planning a family game night. Something of a tradition whenever we tried to get together. The drive from my in-law's house to the nearest store was roughly 20 minutes each way, mostly dirt roads. It wound through dense forest, woods, and open fields. It wasn't uncommon to see deer or other various wildlife crossing these paths at dusk, like raccoons and possums for one. So I always tried to be a very cautious driver at night and keep an eye out. As I mentioned earlier, it was on my return trip when I encountered something that I still struggle to comprehend. The sun now had long since set, and the only source of real light came from my car's headlights as they cut through the darkness. I rounded a sharp bend in one of those dirt roads, about halfway back to my in-law's house. I noted, at what appeared to be the first glance, a very unusually large dog, or wolf, on the side of the road up ahead. It was crouched down near a ditch, its head lowered, seemingly preoccupied with whatever it was eating. Curiosity peaked. However, cautious due to its size, I thought it was an extremely large coyote at the moment. I slowed down as I approached, worried that it would take off and run from the fear of my car in front of my car, and seeing as how I did not want to hit it, I slowed down. It wasn't until my headlights illuminated it fully that I realized this was not just a very large coyote. The first thing that struck me odd about its appearance was just how massive it truly was. It was at least six feet tall on all fours, and its fur was very matted. But what really unsettled me were its eyes. They were this orange color, it almost kind of glowed as it stared back at me, with this intensity I can't even begin to describe, as if sensing my presence or perhaps startled by the sound of my car's engine. It had turned to face me directly, still grasping its meal in one of its massive paws. It was at this moment I realized this animal had hands, but not like a human's more akin to those of an ape or maybe a raccoon, elongated fingers with sharp claws. Adrenaline coursed through my body, and my heart raced. Instinctively, I floored the gas pedal without even thinking. My car sped away from whatever monstrosity stood before me on that dark road, and all I could think about were those eyes burning into mine as if they'd seared themselves onto my soul. I made it back to my in-laws in record time. I was pretty shaken up. 
I hesitated to share what had just transpired, although everybody could tell I was shaken up by something. I tried to write it off. I even casually asked if there was any large dogs or wolves in the area. My father-in-law dismissed it as nothing more than an overactive imagination, perhaps fueled by one too many scary stories. But deep down inside, even now after all this time has passed since that night years ago, I know that it was real. It wasn't just some figment of my imagination or a trick played by the shadows of the woods. And it was not a misidentification. Whatever it was was clearly canine. It's just its size was so off-putting. I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on the matter. I wanted to share with you an experience that has stayed with me for many years. After reading about similar encounters, I felt compelled to finally tell my story. Back in the autumn of 1986, when I was a young man living near the small town of Redfield in South Dakota, hunting had become one of my favorite pastimes. One weekend morning, during deer season, I found me driving along Willow Creek, a picturesque area surrounded by dense wilderness and marshlands teeming with all sorts of flora and fauna. Havit, my wife at the time, decided to join me on this particular hunting trip. She wasn't much of a hunter herself, but she really enjoyed spending time outdoors and taking in the beautiful scenery that our state had to offer. We set out early that morning, with high hopes for a successful day's hunt. We made our way down the highway, heading east towards Redfield, when something truly extraordinary happened. An event which would forever change how I viewed the wilderness, perhaps even life itself. As we approached an area where two highways intersected near Ashton, we decided to take a break and stretch our legs. The sun was now fully above the horizon, casting its warm golden light across the landscape as we parked our truck on a small dirt road. As my wife began unpacking some food from her backpack, I noticed that both she and our trusty Labrador retriever, named Duke, seemed uneasy. Their eyes kept darting back and forth towards an area west of us near Willow Creek. At first, I dismissed them as simply being spooked. After all, this region is home to a large variety of things like coyotes and the occasional mountain lion. If you're not experienced in it, it can overcome you, mentally. I scanned the area with my binoculars in an attempt to identify what had caught their attention. Something truly inexplicable came into view. There, on the opposite side of Willow Creek, was a set of enormous footprints leading up from its banks towards dense woods beyond. Each print measuring approximately 14 inches long. Intrigued by this, but also somewhat unnerved, given that they were miles away from really any known human settlements or hiking trails, I investigated further. My wife, understandably concerned for our safety, she opted to stay behind with Duke while I ventured across the creek. I approached these tracks and began following them. It became increasingly apparent that they were not made by any animal native to this region, or at least none that we knew of. The stride between each print was enormous, far greater than what one would expect from a human or even a large bear. Moreover, there appeared to be no signs of claw marks as is typically seen in prints left by bears or big cats, such as mountain lions. Instead, the tracks appeared to have been made by a bipedal creature with an incredibly powerful stride. I continued following these prints deeper. My sense of unease grew stronger, as if something was watching me from just beyond my line of sight. 
The further I went, the more convinced I became that whatever had left those footprints must still be nearby, perhaps even observing me at this very moment. After what felt like hours, but in reality, could not have been more than 20 minutes or so, it dawned on me now how foolish and reckless my actions had been. I was alone in a very unfamiliar part of the woods, tracking something that could be very, very dangerous, and all without any means to defend myself. As this realization set in, I decided I'd have to turn back now before venturing too far from where we parked our truck. However, just as I began retracing my steps towards Willow Creek, something caught my eye through the trees about 100 feet away. There stood what appeared at first glance to be a man covered head to toe with dark hair or fur. But upon a closer look, this was no man. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Its eyes were an eerie shade of red, kind of like a dim light filtering through them. It stared in my direction. It must have only been several seconds, but its gaze never wavered. It's like it stared into my soul. The creature let out a howl so loud and terrifying, it shook me. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. In that moment, I knew without a doubt that this was no ordinary animal, and certainly not one I wanted to encounter any further. I simply sprinted as fast as my legs would carry me towards Willow Creek, adrenaline coursing through every fiber of my being. As soon as I reached our truck, where my wife anxiously awaited with Duke by her side, we wasted no time leaving those woods behind us for good. And to this day, nearly three decades later since that morning near Redfield, I can't shake the feeling that whatever it was in those woods is still out there somewhere. My wife and I have since moved away from South Dakota to a far more urban area. However, every now and then when visiting family or friends who live near wooded areas, my mind can't help but wander back to that day as if drawn by some inexplicable force towards an enigma which may never be fully understood. There's something special about working in the forest service, something that can only be experienced, not described. It's a feeling of being connected to nature and the wider world around us, a sense of understanding and respect for the land, its inhabitants, and all who pass through it. For me, it started out as a summer job during college, but quickly turned into a lifelong passion. Over the years, I've encountered many different things and have had a multitude of experiences that have both amazed and terrified me. However, there is one experience in particular that stands out above all the others. An encounter with what I can only describe as a wolfman. It was late fall in the dense forests of Quebec, a time when vibrant shades of orange and red painted the trees around us like an artist's canvas. The air was crisp and cool, perfect for hikers who wanted to meander through the woods. I had been assigned to conduct routine maintenance on some remote trails. It required me to traverse several miles deep into untouched wilderness each and every day. One afternoon, making my way back toward base camp after completing my work for the day, something unusual caught my eye off to one side of a small clearing just ahead. Something large, unusually large, moving among the trees. At first glance, it appeared to be just another deer, or possibly moose. But I got closer, and I realized what I was seeing was unlike anything 
I'd ever seen before. What it was was terrifying. It stood at least seven feet tall, with fur reminiscent of a shaggy dog. It stood as an imposing figure peering back at me through the tree line. Its head was distinctly canine-like, a long snout pointed ears that even twitched ever so slightly as it observed my approach. I was unsure of what to do or how to react. I could feel the fear begin to creep up my very spine. I realized that this animal, a bipedal wolf, was unlike any known species native to the area, or anywhere else for that matter. This being seemed just as surprised by our encounter, shifting its weight from one foot to another while maintaining eye contact. It emitted a low noise that kind of was a mix of a growl and a chitter-chatter. Whatever it was sent shivers down my back, but it didn't appear angry or aggressive. Instead, after several tense moments, it seemed to lose interest as it seemed to be drawn to something else in the forest directly to its right, where it quickly dropped down on all fours and continued its pursuit. My heart was racing. I could feel the adrenaline in my body. I knew deep down inside that nobody would believe what I witnessed out here, and truth be told, I could hardly comprehend it myself. Despite years of experience traversing these woods both day and night without much fear or hesitation, something about this particular encounter left its mark on me, one that has never truly faded, even now, many years later, looking back upon it from afar. With a newfound sense of caution and respect for the unknown, I quickly made my way back to base camp, Upon returning, I debated whether or not to share my experience with others, but eventually decided against it, fearing ridicule or disbelief from my own colleagues. However, as time went on and similar reports surfaced of other encounters in various parts of the United States involving creatures that resembled the same one I saw, a very small part of me felt vindicated, knowing that perhaps there was some truth behind these strange sightings after all. Like I said, this put a mark on me. It has served as a reminder that we may never fully understand or comprehend the mysteries hidden within nature's depths. It also serves as a testament to the importance of respecting our environment and its inhabitants both known and unknown. Nowadays, when venturing into wild areas, I'm always mindful that somewhere out there, beyond human perception lies something extraordinary, waiting just around any corner, reminding us all once again why we fell in love with working in the forest in the first place. Ultimately, though, in this world filled with wondrous things, both seen and unseen, I will forever look at each new day spent exploring the woods through fresh eyes, full anticipation, knowing anything is possible if only one takes time to stop long enough and really pay attention to what lies before them. Now, I have some other stories to share with you. I have a fellow colleague of mine, Christopher, who dealt with some pretty strange things on several search and rescue missions. Now, Christopher is a seasoned search and rescue officer. He spent years navigating the most remote and challenging terrains in North America. He is no stranger to odd occurrences or even eerie experiences while on some of these operations. But there were two particular cases that stood out above all the others. One autumn evening, Christopher's team received an urgent call about a hiker who had gone missing while trekking through a notoriously dense forest region. 
they immediately set off with their canine unit to track down any traces of this lost individual. For hours, they scoured the area, but found nothing. No footprints or signs of disturbance anywhere along the trail. As night fell upon them and darkness enveloped their surroundings completely, an unsettling silence began to settle over the entire forest, like thick fog rolling in from afar, making even some veteran officers uneasy, despite countless previous searches under similar conditions, without issue, up until now. Suddenly, though amidst this tense atmosphere, Chris noticed something peculiar just ahead. His dog began acting strangely, becoming increasingly agitated, as if sensing something nearby, yet invisible nonetheless, all lurking still within the shadows beyond human perception. As he approached cautiously, trying best not to disturb whatever presence may have been present around him, unbeknownst to his fellow members, Christopher discovered a small clearing where the hiker's belongings were carefully arranged in a perfect circle. The arrangement seemed deliberate and eerily out of place given the urgency of the search. Despite this strange discovery, there was still no sign of the missing hiker anywhere nearby. They continued searching for days, but ultimately found no further clues or traces leading to her whereabouts. It was as if she had simply vanished into thin air, within that dense forest labyrinth never to be seen again. And last I heard about that case, they found the top of her cranium and a piece of her jawbone seven miles away from where she disappeared. While on another mission, deep within the rugged mountain terrain, Christopher and his team stumbled upon abandoned campsites hidden away near the base of a very steep slope. Upon closer inspection, they, the team, realized that several of these campsites remained pitched along with various personal items all scattered across the ground, seemingly left behind by previous occupants who'd also mysteriously disappeared, without warning nor explanation whatsoever. As darkness fell once more and the temperature dropped significantly, Christopher and his team decided to set up camp nearby for the night, opting to investigate further in daylight. That night, however, proved anything but restful. Unnerving sounds would echo through the valley, roars and heavy footsteps that seemed as though they were circling their very campsite ominously, just beyond reach of visibility, even with the aid from high-powered flashlights. As dawn approached, slowly yet surely, Despite their growing unease amidst this increasingly unsettling atmosphere, Christopher's team discovered newly formed prints encircling the perimeter around their camp. Along these prints were fresh marks etched deeply into tree trunks, all signs of pointing to something large, like an unknown alpha predator, stalking them silently throughout the entire ordeal Although no concrete evidence ever surfaced, these bizarre occurrences really shook up the entire search and rescue team that day. Another good friend of mine, I'll name her Roxanne. She's worked in Yellowstone since 97, and she has also shared some harrowing tales with me that she and other fellow rangers dealt with. Roxanne She's a dedicated and passionate ranger. She's been at Yellowstone for now over two decades. She has accumulated her fair share of chilling stories during her time there. Some of these tales are more famous than others, such as the strange howls in Hayden Valley or even the unexplained lights near Old Faithful. But she has also shared some lesser-known encounters experienced by herself 
and fellow rangers. One moonlit night, while patrolling the dense woods around Tower Fall, Roxanne began hearing faint whispers echoing through the trees, an eerie phenomenon often reported by visitors but rarely ever encountered firsthand by rangers themselves. These voices seemed to be coming from all directions, simultaneously making it nearly impossible to pinpoint their exact origin. All within the darkness itself, it seemed to be enveloping everything in sight. As she cautiously ventured deeper, following the trail towards the source of the sound, sudden gusts of wind would hit her, causing her to stand still before momentarily subsiding once again. Whatever it was, it felt like negative energy, and Roxanne had a very sensitive perception to the supernatural. She did report this experience back, where she discovered that several of her colleagues had also experienced similar encounters with what they would refer to as these mysterious voices throughout their entire careers. While there is no concrete explanation for the phenomenon, it is determined that they might be ancient Native American spirits still present within Yellowstone's sacred lands. Another harrowing tale shared by Roxanne involves a fellow ranger named Mike who once encountered something inexplainable near the Mammoth Hot Springs during his routine patrol late one evening. As he followed the winding trails through steam-filled geothermal areas lit only by the faint moonlight above, Mike suddenly noticed an unusually large and dark figure standing motionless in the distance watching him intently. The shadowy entity seemed unnaturally tall, towering over the landscape ominously. Despite its lack of any real discernible features, Mike, concerned that it was a hiker or a camper trying to play an elaborate prank, cautiously moved closer, attempting to get a better look, while still trying to maintain a safe distance just in case this wasn't a hoax. The figure was standing perfectly still, and as Mike grew closer, all of a sudden, this thing leapt up into the air roughly 30 to 40 feet, like something out of a movie, and disappeared in the canopy of the trees above. It was completely not human, as Mike described it. This experience remained etched in Mike's memories for years to come, serving as yet another reminder that Yellowstone, among many of our national parks, holds many secrets beneath its picturesque landscapes. One summer afternoon, Roxanne received an urgent call in regards to a hiker who had gone missing near Mount Washburn. Immediately, a search party consisting of fellow rangers and experienced volunteers scoured the area for any signs of this lost individual. They searched high and low through steep inclines and dense underbrush. One volunteer stumbled upon something utterly chilling an abandoned campsite with all belongings still neatly arranged alongside remnants of what appeared to be hastily extinguished fire pits. However, there was no sign of a hiker or any real indication of what really happened to them. It seems as if they had just been run off by someone or something. The search continued well into nightfall, but proved fruitless in locating missing persons despite exhaustive efforts made throughout the entire ordeal. Roxanne and her fellow rangers couldn't help but feel a sense of unease each time they embarked on similar search missions in this specific region they had actually marked on their map. It's roughly about a 12 by 15 section of the woods that weird stuff is known to happen strange noises accompanied by feelings of immense dread, sickness, delusion, lightheaded, and even nausea. Anyway, 
These tales shared by Roxanne do serve as a stark reminder to both visitors and staff alike that these parks, while not only a place of great and immense beauty, but are also one where the unknown can lurk beyond our perception. It remains essential for everyone venturing within this majestic landscape to maintain an air of caution and respect for their surroundings in all time, while keeping in mind the strange things that can happen, just like the first-hand experiences shared by Roxanne and others who have dedicated their lives working tirelessly to protect those in and out of the parks. The story I'm about to tell happened in the 90s, around 1994. My husband worked in a warehouse that delivered furniture to stores, and I worked cleaning houses. We made okay money from our jobs, but we always lived a bit of a limited life. At least we were able to keep a roof over our heads and food in the fridge. Definitely not rich by any stretch of the means. The family that owned the warehouse that my husband worked for, they were pretty well off. And what was nice was that they had this house up in Big Bear. I cleaned it for them whenever they came back from family outings. Now, whenever that happened, we would have a family outing of our own. They would go there at least four times a year. So that meant we would go four times too. We would always plan it so that we would leave on a Thursday and come back Monday morning. The family knew we did this. It was actually their idea. We'd spend most of our time there relaxing and living it up like we couldn't do at home. Our daughter was young in those days, so I loved the idea of taking her out into nature. The fresh air, the trees taking her on walks. It was nice. We enjoyed ourselves until the last day before we would leave. On that day, I'd start cleaning. One summer, I had to go clean up the house after a 4th of July party that the family hosted. My daughter was about 4 or 5 at this time. We left at noon and got there around 7. The house was 3 stories tall. The living room and kitchen were on the second floor, with bedrooms in the first and third floors. My daughter's favorite was the first floor because it had a room with a trunk full of toys and board games. The house was pretty secluded, with an open backyard that, if you walked far enough, you would eventually reach a lake. You could even see it from the third floor balcony. Anyway... One night, my husband went to bed early, but my daughter couldn't sleep, so I let her play downstairs with some toys. I was upstairs in the living room, watching television, and she comes running into the room, bawling. I asked what was wrong. Was she hurt? But she was scared. She says that she saw something outside her window, that a big dog was growling at her. I told her not to worry. She probably just saw some stray animal. I asked her to show me, but she did not want to. I was surprised to be this honest. My daughter loves animals, but this scary dog really had her shook up. I kissed her, told her to head upstairs to Daddy, and I would check it out and make sure it was gone. She went upstairs. I went downstairs. The first floor had a deck out the back, looking over the yard. I slid open the door leading outside and turned on the lights. There was an awful smell out there, like sulfur or urine. Whatever it was, it was strong. It stung the back of my nose. I looked down. I noticed the deck was wet. It hadn't rained for days. But what really got me was what I saw on the deck. Prints. They were kind of like a dog's, but two things stood out. First was just the overall shape. They had the shape of a paw, but 
much bigger and longer. And secondly, the footprints themselves, well, whatever this was, it wasn't walking on four legs, but on two. I wasn't sure in the dark, but the way they were spaced out didn't look like a dog, like my daughter said. The prince went across the deck and down the steps. I went inside to grab a flashlight. I wanted to check to see if it was trying to get into the garbage cans. I followed the prince to the end of the deck and down the stairs. This is where I saw the ground was damp. I followed the footsteps all the way to the front of the house, where they suddenly stopped. I stood there for a while, looking into the dark, listening. And soon, I heard a rumbling above me. I shined my light towards the roof, which sloped down, near to the ground, and saw it there, sitting on the shingles. What I saw had the face similar to a German shepherd, but much bigger. It was dripping water. Its ears were upright and sharp, sort of like a bat's, but thinner. The eyes were a bright yellow, almost like hot embers, and it was snarling. I couldn't see it clearly and thought it might be a rabid dog. So I started yelling, waving my arms around to scare it, hoping that if I pretended to be bigger, that it might run away. Then, this mangy thing stood up on its two hind legs. It towered over me from the roof, like three of me put together. It was angry. Teeth were bared. With my flashlight, I was able to make out its body. It was broad, wide-chested, but it wasn't completely hairy. It was like it had mange, with part of its arm red, like it had been wounded. It was stripped almost completely of hair, and the eyes with the light on them looked like they were glowing. At the moment, I was petrified. I thought I was in a nightmare that a demon from another world was staring me down. It felt like I stood there, frozen, for an eternity. Finally, I took a step back, but tripped and fell on my back. The flashlight fell, and I lost all visibility. All I could see was a silhouette from the faint moonlight. I started shuffling backwards, trying not to make any sudden moves that might agitate it, whatever it was. And then, it jumped. And I mean jumped like at least maybe 10, 15 feet in the air, over top of me. It landed behind me and took off. I scrambled up, ran to the front door, and hurried inside as fast as I could, locking the door behind me. I started up the stairs and noticed my daughter coming down to see me. She asked if the scary dog was gone. The whole ordeal left me sweaty and trembling. I told her, yeah, the dog is gone and everything's okay. From that day on, I was scared there. My wife would always ask why I was on the edge when we went to Big Bear. We even had fights about it. Eventually, the arguments stopped when the family sold the house. But what happened there never left my mind. What I saw that day was the stuff of nightmares. A moment that felt so... Unreal, but real. I know what I saw. When I was in high school, I played on the basketball team and ran track. To keep my cardio up, I used to run this 11-kilometer hiking trail that went through the hills right outside my town. It was a small town. It was safe for the most part. And everybody knew each other. I wouldn't call this trail remote, because at certain points you pass a dog park, train tracks, and one stretch of it ran alongside the highway. But some parts were pretty deep into the woods. There was an option to do this 
four kilometer loop inside of this 11 kilometer trail. People travel this route much more often. I hardly ever ran into anybody on the longer trail. I ran this same trail for three years. Nothing strange ever happened. Until this one day. It started off as it normally did. I parked my car on the dirt road that came off of the highway, smoked a joint while queuing songs on my phone. I put my earphones in, popped a piece of gum in my mouth, and began walking toward the trail. The only thing I took with me on my runs were my phone, earphones, and a single car key wrapped around my index finger. I don't recall seeing anybody on the trail that day. It was in the afternoon, and it was not abnormal for the trail to be less busy than it would have been during the evening. I walked for a few minutes while I was still on the crushed stone path. Once you got a little ways into the trail, it turned pretty rugged. Dirt and mud with large tree roots reaching across it in all directions. I liked this trail because I had to focus on where my feet were landing with every step. So I was less focused on how much energy I was exerting. I was about halfway through the 11 kilometer loop, and this was really the most remote part of it. It was all forest. There were a little of hills and dips in the path, big boulders all around you. I did not see or hear anything odd, but out of nowhere, I had this extreme sense of dread creep over me. I kept running, didn't really react. Once I reached a more flat part of the trail, just a few feet ahead, I took my earphones out while keeping the same running pace. I noticed it was eerily silent, but I did not experience a moment where I acknowledged that meant there's likely some sort of predator in the area. The only predators that would have been around me for wildlife would be a coyote, maybe a bear. But this would be very unlikely, as there are never bear sightings anywhere near the town. So I slowed my jog to a walk, and the trail started getting steep, and I had to walk over knee-high rocks. I was still moving fast, because I felt like something was behind me. Now for some reason, this next part is very hard to remember. Just this slice of about 30 seconds feels almost like I'm trying to recall a dream that I had, but I saw something out in the trees. Now when I try to remember, I can't fully picture it, almost like looking at a blurry image. It wasn't an animal, it was a person. I can't explain it, but I could clearly sense that it was a male. I pretended not to see the figure in the trees, I remember doing this so they wouldn't know that I was aware of them. It felt subconscious, automatic, and 100% instinctive. The figure wasn't behind me in the way that it felt when I first sensed a presence. It was in front of me, but on my side, my two o'clock to be exact. It didn't move as I walked by. The person just stood there completely still and watched me pass. Once I got up around the turn, probably 15 feet ahead, I ran so fast it was like my feet were going to detach from my body. I remember how weak my knees felt in the sprint, but adrenaline was carrying me out there at a speed that was faster than I've ever moved in my life. I didn't hear the footsteps but it felt like they were right behind me, as if I would feel two hands reach out and grab me at any moment. Primal fear. I didn't stop running until I was out of the trees and could very visibly see my car. This may feel anticlimactic, but nothing happened when I looked back after leaving the trees. There was no one there. My adrenaline was flooding the entire time but the deep sense of dread 
left a couple of minutes after it arrived. I just knew I couldn't stop running until I was out. I think somebody was after me because they saw a five-foot young girl with long blonde hair running alone in the woods. Maybe they were waiting for somebody to pass by. But I have a gut feeling that they were out there for some other reason. And I happened to walk by at the wrong time. I know. It may seem like I just smoked a joint, went into the woods alone and wigged out, but I'd been smoking weed every day for about five years at this point, not proud of how young I was when I started, and I did this every single time before I went on a run on that trail, four times a week for three years. Nothing like this ever happened to me before or after this run, although I did switch trails after two or three more visits. I didn't feel the sense of dread that I felt that day, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it might happen again. Sometimes I wonder if something would have happened to me if I kept running there. I don't live there anymore. I haven't for a while. And I haven't heard of anything bad happening there. But someone was in the woods that day and they did not have good intentions when they saw me walk by them standing in the trees. Has anybody else ever been out in the woods and experienced this sense of dread without seeing or hearing danger? I want to share an experience I had in the Florida Everglades in 2021. It was early summer, and I was preparing my airboat to race in the yearly speed contest. I had just completed several test runs for speed along the Tam Miami Trail, reaching speeds of about 100 miles per hour, but I knew I could go faster. As a result, I came to a stop with the boat so that I could work on the engine and make sure that I had the proper mixture of fuel to achieve my maximum speed. That was when I heard it, the sound of an alligator coming from the swamp. The sound was so loud and menacing that it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. In all my time spent in the Everglades, I've seen and heard a great number of alligators, but I've never heard a bellow quite like this one. I could tell it was a large alligator just by the sound that it made. I saw it coming out from the tall grass. It was about a hundred feet away. It was unlike any gator I had ever seen before. It was massive, easily over 20 feet. Its body rose above the surface of the water. After that, it did something that was far more terrifying than anything I could have ever imagined. It stood up on its hind legs. It towered over the water at a height of more than 10 feet and was as tall as the pilot chair on my boat. I'm not sure how to fully describe it. It had a head that resembled an alligator, only smaller. Its snout was not exceptionally long, yet its mouth was brimming full of teeth. The eyes were set back and large, with large pupils, black as coal. The front legs closely resembled the arms of a gorilla. They hung down, were full of muscles and had hands with fingers. In addition, they had long claws that extended approximately four inches. I couldn't tell what the legs looked like because they were below the water, but I could see they were thick and muscular. This thing started to walk towards the boat. I knew I had to get out of there, and fast. But of course, my engine would not start. I became trapped. It turned to one side as if turning away from me, and I could see its back was like an alligator's, except it had these spikes that would stick out. As it turned back towards me, it brought both hands together, smacking the water, creating a wave that came at the boat, almost knocking it over. I thought about jumping overboard and swimming, but I realized I could not outswim this thing. So I sat there, frozen, not knowing what to do. I tried starting the engine again. This time it started. I revved it up, 
and took off as fast as it would go. It only took me several seconds to reach 60 miles an hour. The beast swam through the water close behind. It wasn't until I reached the speed of about 80 that it started to fall behind. Yet, I could see that it was still following me. I wondered what beast could travel at that speed. It took several moments to get back to the launch ramp. As soon as I arrived, I immediately jumped from the boat, ran to my truck, grabbing my rifle. Looking back into the swamp, I could see the beast just lying offshore. I fired two shots directly at it. I know I hit it, but it didn't move. I was about to shoot again, but it very slowly went under the water. I couldn't see it anymore. I have since sold my boat, and I will never be going back into the Everglades. I used to enjoy watching my father fish when I was a young boy, and I suppose it was inevitable that I would follow in his footsteps as I got older. And that I did. I worked as a fisherman for 40 years, and I suppose the years drifted by quickly. And it's only now, at 87, that I pause to reflect on the past, and I feel now's the right time to come forward about an experience that I had at the age of 19. During the summer of 1952, two of my colleagues and I were on our boat off the Cornwall coast. We were looking to cast our rods to catch red salmon, as we were getting a handsome check for providing a local butcher with fish. It was a hot summer day, and we had a few beers with us on the boat. Our t-shirts were off. We were enjoying waving at a group of young ladies who were having a picnic on the coast. We didn't know the girls, but they beckoned us to come and join them for their picnic. It was certainly enticing for a 19-year-old. I'd been working as a fisherman's apprentice for around five years at that time. It was very rare that I ever encountered the opposite sex. The ladies beckoned us. The smell of their vanilla perfume seemed to gather and cluster on our boat. Their soft, feminine overtones were almost hypnotic, filling me with a youthful desire. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Well, what occurred on that day was nothing but sheer madness, sheer terror. As I was waving to the girls, the others on board decided to jump overboard and swim towards the shoreline and walk up to meet the girls. I told them that it seemed like a good idea and encouraged them to go. No sooner had they jumped overboard than the sky became very gray and it started to rain heavily. I watched as they struggled to swim against increasingly erratic waves. I caught a glimpse of the girls and I could see them jumping up and running away. I started to wonder if I was missing something, or if it was some kind of trick girl's play, because it seemed like it was too good to be true. Maybe they were afraid of the impending rainstorm, or perhaps they were hesitant to actually meet guys. The sky continued to pour, and I noticed that my friends were struggling very heavily. I witnessed a horror that made my hands shake with fright. A large serpentine creature shot up out from the ocean, long, over 15 feet, huge body, green and oily, similar to a sea snake. It had fangs that looked to be a foot long. The size of its head that was protruding from its body was larger than a human's head. It was a disturbing sight and just the memory alone terrifies me. The guys in the water noticed it too, and I noticed that it seemed to be hunting them. It lunged at one of my friends. I saw signs of blood in the water. I grabbed something nearby and threw it out in the direction which the serpent was now thrashing around, jumping in and weaving out of the ocean like a dolphin, but viciously, 
with a clear intent to wound and kill. The creature then turned around, noticed me, and bolted towards my direction through the water. As soon as it was close enough, its enormous tail shot up out of the water and attempted to cut me in the face, but I managed to block it with an oar in the boat. It seemed like it was intent on striking me. It sprang about, thrashing and hungry for human flesh. I was absolutely petrified beyond belief. I had never witnessed such a creature before. And at only 19 years old, I was still a virgin of the sea. Even my own father had never heard of anything remotely similar to this or come across anything of the sort. The creature that resembled a serpent was able to climb aboard the boat and it was now facing me head on. The boat capsized slightly. Seawater began pouring in, both at my feet quickly. It felt like I was going to die, but I knew I would not give up without a fight. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was going to lose. I continued kicking frantically, hoping that if it made contact, it would retreat in fear. But this thing looked just as vicious as it did hungry. I managed to hit it, slightly with the oar. The problem was that the boat was now almost completely submerged. Instantaneously, the storm had been raging overhead, ended all of a sudden, and the serpent-like creature dove back down into the water. The sea became calm and still, and I now felt safe to swim to shore. By the time I got there, my friends were nowhere to be seen. I found them later. They were still bleeding from the deep wounds and cuts from where this creature had attacked them. When we told other people about our experience, no one believed us. However, a biologist said it was possible that it could have been a mysterious underwater serpent that had not yet been discovered. Whatever it was, it was terrifying and I was glad to have never encountered it again in all the years I spent fishing. Look, I know this might sound outlandish, but this is a story that happened when I was younger. I haven't experienced anything like it since. I know there are crazy tales of sea experiences out there, and, well, this is mine. Just remember that almost every fisherman out there has his or her own story to tell. The swamps of New Orleans were never a place for the faint of heart. It was a place of mysterious and dark secrets that lay hidden in the murky depths. Roads were deserted, the air heavy with humidity, and the sounds of insects and night creatures eerie and haunting. It was in this foreboding place that my journey began. My companions and I had been traveling for days. We were exhausted. We had been driving for hours, the swamps around us growing denser with each mile, when suddenly we hit a fork in the road. It was there on this highway that I had my first real taste with the supernatural. As we drove down the road, our eyes straining to see through the dense fog, a figure appeared in front of us. At first, I thought it was just a large animal, perhaps a bear, but as we got closer, I could see that something was different. The figure was tall and loping. Its fur was shaggy and unkempt. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and its teeth were sharp and pointed. I swerved to avoid hitting the thing, my heart racing with fear and confusion. I could feel my companion's tension as we all shared a moment of intense silence. For a few moments, we sat there, stunned, staring at the creature as it disappeared into the bog. We were all struggling to comprehend what we had just seen. As we continued on our journey, I could feel my mind racing with questions. What was that creature? Was it an animal, or was it something more? Was it a figment of my imagination, or was it a real living being? 
The swamps were eerily silent, the only sound being the car engine as we drove deeper into the darkness. The lack of amenities was unsettling. I felt a growing sense of unease. It was as if the swamps were closing in on us, the fog and the darkness swallowing us whole. By the time we had arrived at our destination, I was more than ready to get out of the car and stretch my legs. We had made it through the first leg of our journey, but I knew that I would never forget what I had seen on that lonely highway. It was a moment that would stay with me forever, a moment that would change the way I saw the world around me. As we settled into our lodging for the night, I found myself replaying the events of the evening over and over in my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled into something extraordinary, something beyond our understanding. The swamps of New Orleans were a place of mystery, perhaps magic, a place where the veil between the living and the dead was thin. It was a place where the supernatural was all too real, and I knew that my encounter with this creature was only the beginning of a journey into the unknown. The encounter on that highway had left me shaken. I found myself struggling to make sense of what I'd seen, my mind racing, trying to find a logical explanation for the creature I had encountered. But I knew deep down that there was no rational explanation. As we settled in for the night, my mind was still consumed by the memory of this creature. I could not shake the feeling that we were being watched, that there was something lurking in the shadows just beyond our reach. The next morning, we set out to explore the swamps. Our guide led us deeper into the bog, pointing out various plants, flora and fauna, all of things that called the swamps home. As we walked, I found myself scanning the surroundings, looking for any signs of the creature I had encountered the night before. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look, and there it was. The same creature from the night before, it was standing at the edge of the swamp, watching us. Its gaze and eyes were piercing. At first, I froze, unable to comprehend what was happening. But then the fear set in, and I knew we had to get out of there. We quickly turned and headed back the way we had come, the creature following close behind. As we ran, I could almost feel the hot breath of it on my back, on my neck, its long, loping strides quickly closing the distance between us. I thought for sure we were done for, and that the creature would catch us, and we would meet a gruesome end. But then, something unexpected happened. The creature stopped in its tracks, its eyes fixed on something just beyond us. We paused, watching as the creature slowly backed away, disappearing into the bog once more. It was then that I realized this creature was not necessarily out to harm us. It was simply curious, watching us from a distance, and only attacking when it felt threatened. It was a sobering realization, and it left me with more questions than answers. As we made our way back to our lodging, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The creature we had encountered was not like anything I'd ever seen before, and I knew that this was far from over. We were in the midst of something extraordinary, something beyond our understanding, and I knew that we only had scratched the surface of what was to come. This encounter had left me with a newfound respect for the supernatural, a sense of wonder and awe at the mysteries that lay just beyond our understanding. It was a feeling that would stay with me for the rest of my life, a reminder that there is still so much to learn and explore. We continued to explore the swamps around New Orleans. I found myself constantly on the lookout for any signs of this thing, every rustle in the bushes, every shadow in the distance, it all made my heart race with anticipation. It wasn't long before we heard whispers of other sightings in the area, sightings of a creature that was tall, covered in fur, 
and walked on two legs. The locals called it Bigfoot, or Sasquatch. Many claimed to have seen it lurking in the same shadows of the very same swamps we roamed around in. The more we learned about Sasquatch, the more I began to wonder if the creature we had encountered was in fact this legendary creature. The descriptions of the creature matched up almost perfectly with what we had seen. I knew that we had stumbled upon something different, something strange. With this newfound knowledge, we set out to explore the swamps once more. This time, a renewed sense of vigor and purpose. We traveled deeper into the heart of the swamp, following a trail that we hoped would lead us to the den of this creature. As we walked, the swamps grew denser, the air thick with the sounds of that same animal that called it home. I could feel the sweat running down my face, my heart racing with anticipation. And then we all saw it, a tall, shaggy creature emerging from the shadows. Its fur was matted and unkempt. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. I'm assuming it was the Sasquatch, the creature that had eluded us for a while now. I was frozen with fear, unsure of what to do at first. But this thing stepped forward, its eyes fixed on us with an even more curious gaze. It's almost as if it was studying us, trying to understand what we were doing there. As we watched, it slowly backed away, disappearing into the shadows once again. We knew that we had just witnessed something different, something few had seen or experienced before. Over the next few days, we explored the swamps, constantly on the lookout for any signs of it. We learned more about the legends and stories that surround this elusive creature, and we began to realize just how little we knew about the world around us. Our encounter was a humbling experience, a reminder of just how small we are in the grand scheme of the universe. It was a moment that would stay with me for the rest of my life, a reminder that things are different and things are waiting to be discovered. I've been a hunter my whole life. Grew up in a small town in the rural Midwest, and there's nothing I love more than spending time in the woods. In fact, every year in October, I make a pilgrimage to a particularly remote section of the forest, about 12 miles from the nearest road, and set up my deer stand. The story in question begins. It was a beautiful day when I headed out. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and there was a crispness to the air that told me winter was well on its way. I was looking forward to spending a few days alone in solace in the woods, just me and the deer. I hiked deep in the woods, following the winding trails that I knew so well. The terrain was rough, but I was used to it. It had been coming to the spot for years, and I can navigate the woods blindfolded if I have to. Okay, well, maybe not that confidently, but you get what I'm trying to say. When I finally arrived at the clearing where I usually set up camp, I began unloading my gear, and it was right then and there that I heard a noise that still unsettles me. It was this guttural growling sound coming from the tree line. It made me stop what I was doing and look around, but I didn't see anything. So I shrugged it off and continued setting up my gear. Now, everything went pretty normal. The sun started to set. I built a small fire and settled in for the night. I couldn't shake the feeling, though, that something wasn't right. The woods were too quiet, too still. It was like the animals had all fled the area. I had heard the growl again. This time it was closer. And I could see movement now, movement through the trees, with a very unnatural speed and grace. And like from going zero to 100, I saw them. I saw what appeared to be a pack of creatures moving in on me through the trees. Now, bear with me here when I say this, but what these things looked like, they looked like they were straight out of a Hollywood horror movie. 
They had shaggy fur, pointed ears, and jagged, horrible teeth. They were tall, lean, and more muscular than any wolf I'd ever seen. Their eyes were like glowing embers. I was frozen in terror as they approached my camp. I tried my best to make myself small, to blend in with the area around me, but it was no use. They had seen me. They were coming for me fast. And that was just the beginning of the five days of terror that would follow. The pack of these creatures, whatever they were, moved with an eerie synchronicity as they approached my camp. I could hear their growls and see their eyes glowing. I was paralyzed with fear, and I knew that I had to act fast as if I was going to survive. I grabbed my rifle, tried to take aim, but they were too fast. They darted in and out of the trees, always staying just out of reach of my bullets. I realized that I needed to get out of there, find a way to escape, but these things had me cornered. I knew that any attempt to run would be futile, so I did the only thing I could. I hunkered down and I waited. I prayed that they would lose interest and leave me alone, but they did not. These things circled my camp all night, snarling and making all sorts of horrible noises. But why weren't they coming in? Why weren't they attacking me? Maybe this was an intimidation tactic. I could hear their claws against the ground. I knew they were watching me, waiting for me to make a move. I tried to stay awake to keep watch, but exhaustion eventually overtook me, and I fell into a fitful sleep, my rifle by my side hoping that the morning would bring relief. When I woke up, they were still there. They had not left, and I knew that I was in for a long, terrifying ordeal. I spent the next few days trying to evade them. I would try and make a run for it. They would chase after, their eyes still glowing. I even attempted to climb a tree, and they would just claw at the trunk, trying to knock me down. I was outmatched, outgunned, I had no idea how to defend myself against these things. All I could do was try to stay alive. I tried to use my knowledge of the woods to my advantage. I would climb up rocky outcroppings or steep hills, hoping to put some distance between me and these things. But they were always right behind me. I tried to use my rifle, but it was no use. These things were too fast, far too agile. It's like they were able to dodge bullets with ease, and I knew that wasting precious ammunition was not worth it. The days wore on, I became increasingly desperate. I was quickly running out of food and water, and I knew I could not keep up this game of cat and mouse forever. Maybe they were far more intelligent than I can imagine. Maybe they got a sick thrill of playing cat and mouse with me till I ran out of options and nearly starved to death before they pounced on their prey. Maybe that's why they didn't attack me yet. I tried to make a fire one night, hoping to cook some food I had brought with me. I fleed with my life. They still pursued. They seemed to take pleasure in the hunt and the terror they were causing. It's almost like they were purposely prolonging my death. I never felt so alone, so helpless. But I refused to give up. I kept moving, kept trying to find a way out. I was determined, no matter what. I was lost, hungry and thirsty now. My feet were blistered. My legs were sore from running and climbing. I had no idea where I was, and I was quickly losing hope. I had always prided myself on my ability to navigate the woods, but now I was hopelessly turned around. I tried to use my compass and map, but they were no help. These things had chased me off course. I had no idea how to get back on track. It's almost like they were hurting me in a specific direction. I was feeling like I was going crazy. The constant fear and adrenaline had taken their toll on my mind and body and exhaustion. I was jumpy, irritable. I found myself imagining things that weren't there. I even stumbled across a small stream. I had been without water for a day. I knelt down and drank deeply, feeling the cool water wash over me. It was like a bomb to my parched throat. But the relief was short-lived. As I drank, I heard the growling coming up. I looked and saw them watching me. 
I knew that I had to leave. I couldn't stay in one place for long. I was too weak, far too exhausted. I had tried to find some shelter, to make a fire and wait out the night. But they found me. They always did. I was left exposed to the elements, no protection from the cold. I knew I was in serious trouble. I was lost, alone, and being hunted by unknown predators that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. I had no idea how I was going to make it out alive. I was at the end of my rope. I had been running and hiding for days. I was beginning to lose hope. I knew that I couldn't keep this up forever. Sooner or later, they would catch up to me, and I'd be all over. But something miraculous happened. I stumbled across a service road. It was like a beacon of hope in the midst of darkness. I could hardly believe my luck. I followed the road for miles, my heart pounding with excitement. I knew that I was getting closer to civilization, closer to safety. But these things were still out there, still hunting me. They were always just a few steps behind, their eyes glowing in the dark. I could still hear their noises, and I knew I was not out of danger yet. I tried to stay focused, to keep moving forward, but it was hard. I was exhausted, sore, weak, and hungry. The road stretched on forever. I saw lights of a town in the distance. I stumbled to the nearest gas station. How? I don't know. My clothes were torn. I was scratched, bleeding, almost on the verge of collapsing. I must have looked like a wild man. The people at the gas station were shocked to see me. They called the police and an ambulance, and I was quickly taken to the hospital. I was treated for dehydration and malnutrition, and I spent the next few days recovering. It took me a long time to process what had happened. I had never believed in the supernatural before, but now I have a different feeling about it. These things, whatever they were, had hunted me, and I survived. I still go hunting now, crazy, right? But I'm much more careful. I don't go into the woods alone and I always carry several weapons. I know that I can never let my guard down again. The real question here is how long were these things going to chase me for? Were they just letting me go until I was weak and going to die? Or were they just playing a game, the same game that a cat plays with a mouse before it finally grows bored of that game and devours it? I'm glad I never found out. As I sit here, reflecting on my life, I can't help but think about that fateful backpacking trip to Mount Shasta in 1979. Every year, my friend Jim and I would take a trip to a remote location to disconnect from the world and bask in the beauty of nature. That year, we chose Mount Shasta as our destination. Jim was a tall, lanky guy, with a smile that could light up any room. He was an avid outdoorsman, and his love for nature was infectious. I, on the other hand, was a short, stocky guy who was not as physically fit as Jim. However, I had a deep sense of spirituality, and I believed that nature was God's way of showing us his power and majesty. After a grueling day of hiking, we finally arrived at our campsite, we quickly set up our tent and started a campfire. We planned on spending the next few days fishing and hiking the trails all around the mountain. As the sun began to set, we sat around the campfire, telling stories and reminiscing about old times. The night was filled with laughter and joy. I remember feeling grateful for the friendship I had with Jim. Little did I know, our trip was about to take a terrifying turn. As the night sky grew darker, Jim and I decided to get our fishing gear and head to a nearby creek. We were both avid fishermen and we had high hopes of catching some trout for dinner. As we made our way through the forest, I started feeling uneasy. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but the feeling persisted. My eyes caught something near the tree line. A large, no, a giant figure, 
that seemed to be covered in dark hair. My heart raced as I realized we were not alone. Whatever animal this was had to have been at least eight feet tall with broad shoulders and massive arms. Its eyes were small and deep set. Its face was mostly hidden behind what I would describe as a thick, woolly beard. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. My mind struggled to make sense of what was in front of me. My fear turned into panic. I realized we were trapped. I tried to run, but my feet felt like they were glued to the ground. I was frozen in place, staring at the creature in terror. As a devout Catholic, I turned to prayer. I closed my eyes, reciting the Lord's Prayer, hoping that God would protect us from this mysterious creature. Suddenly, the creature's expression changed. It didn't seem aggressive or threatening. In fact, it looked curious, almost as if it was studying us. As I opened my eyes, I saw the creature slowly fade away into a wispy mist. I couldn't believe what I just witnessed, and I was shaking with fear and confusion. I fled back to our campsite, trying to catch my breath. When I told Jim what had happened, he seemed skeptical at first. But as he looked at my face, he realized that something had scared me. That's when he revealed that he had seen the same creature earlier in the day, but he had assumed it was just a bear. We both realized that we were not alone in the forest, and we were being watched by something we could not explain. Our plans for the trip were now thrown into complete disarray. We were too scared to stay in the area, and we decided to pack up our things and start hiking back down the mountain. As we hiked down the mountain, our minds were racing with questions about what we had just experienced. We couldn't believe that we had seen something so incredible and terrifying at the same time. As we walked, we kept glancing over our shoulders, half expecting what we saw to reappear, but it never did. Eventually, we made our way back. We drove to a nearby town and got some grub and rest. We were both exhausted from the hike and the emotional toll that this had taken on us. As we sat in a small podunk diner, we discussed what we had seen. We tried to make sense of the appearance but we couldn't come up with any logical explanation. Perhaps it was a mutated bear. Maybe it was a bear with mange. The more we talked, the more we realized that this bear seemed to be curious, almost as if it was studying us. We both felt a sense of awe and wonder at what we had experienced, despite the fear and panic that had accompanied it. When we got back to our hometown, we told our families about the encounter. They were skeptical, but as they saw the fear and confusion that we both wore on our faces, they realized we were not making it up. Months went by. We tried to move on. But the memory lingered and persisted. We could not shake the feeling that we had witnessed something truly paranormal. Now, it wasn't until a few years later that we had our next breakthrough. Jim and I were at a family gathering. We began talking to our cousin, who was actually a park ranger in a nearby national park. We described the creature. Our cousin's eyes widened in recognition. He told us that there had been reports of similar sightings in the area, and the creature was commonly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. You have to understand that in 1979, even though the concept of Bigfoot was starting to become known, it still wasn't really accepted. Not like it is now. And I had not seen the Patterson film just yet at this time. Not to mention, the Mount Shasta area, I would learn later, is a hotbed for encounters. While we couldn't confirm whether or what we had seen was indeed Bigfoot, we were relieved to know that we were not the only ones who had experienced something strange in that area. It was a moment of reunion and validation. It gave us a sense of closure and peace. Our lives were never quite the same. We became fascinated with the phenomenon of Bigfoot. We tried to read every book and article we can find on the subject. We went on expeditions to search for evidence, but we never found anything conclusive. The encounter has also had an impact in our worldview. 
there are things this life can't explain, and that we need to be more open-minded about mysteries. We also struggled with the aftermath. We were both plagued by nightmares and anxiety. We found it hard to shake off the feeling that we were being watched any time we went in the woods. It was as if that encounter had marked us, but as time went on, we learned to cope with the experience. We realized that we had witnessed something incredible and that we were lucky to have had the moment of connection with the natural world. The encounter also brought us closer together. We had been through something profound and life-changing. We knew we could always rely on one another for support and understanding. As we grew older, we started to share our story with others, trying to spread awareness about the mysteries of the unspoken world. We hoped that our story would inspire others who are more curious and open-minded. Looking back, the encounter with this thing had a profound impact. It challenged our beliefs, expanded our spiritual horizons, and brought us closer together than we could imagine. It was a moment we would never forget, and it's now become a part of my life's history and legacy.